Thank you. So um, I wanted to introduce everyone. So welcome our audience to the first day of the Real Truth About Health Conference and to our first panel. Um, this panel is about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And I'd like if each of you would just tell us who you are and what your most recent book was and just a one minute summary of what you've been doing the last 20 years. So everyone could just connect with you just for a minute before we start the questions. Uh, you gonna, what do you, what sure. do you want to start? I, you could start, Dr. Bredesen. Okay, sure. Yeah. So my name is Dale Bredesen uh, and I've been interested for my whole career in mechanisms of neurodegeneration. We spent 30 years in the lab looking at what drives the neurodegenerative process. And then in the last 10 years, we've been trying to translate this into effective strategies. And my most recent book uh, is called The First Survivors of Alzheimer's. Uh, we published a trial uh, with improvement in cognition just last year, and we're starting our next larger trial, randomized controlled trial, in just a couple of months. Steve? Okay, I can go next if you like. Um, I'm not sure. Am I up? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, my name is Steve Blake, and uh, my most recent book, well, <laughs> I have quite a few of them, but uh, relevant to this is Nutrients for Memory and Parkinson's disease, dietary regulation of dopamine. And I uh, work at the Maui Memory Clinic and also work extensively publishing uh, with various places from <clears throat> Macmillan to McGraw-Hill and also scholarly papers. And I look forward to helping people who are attending this talk understand some more about what they can do to help reduce the risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Ray Dorsey. I'm a neurologist at the University of Rochester. Delighted to be part of this distinguished panel and be part of this uh, conference. Uh, my colleagues and I wrote this book called Ending uh, Parkinson's Disease, which is the world's fastest growing brain disease. My passion is that I think much of this uh, Parkinson's is preventable and I'd like us to uh, create a world where Parkinson's disease is again rare and not common. Okay, so thank you all. And this topic is a little bit sensitive to me as a close person in my life. I'm in their 50s, got early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So I am familiar with uh, some of the issues related to having this, this health challenge. Um, so for the, this is our ninth year doing the Real Truth About Health Conference. And a lot of us many years ago got very excited when Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn said that you can be heart attack proof. And a lot of us found that diet and lifestyle could offer tremendous hope when it comes to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. <clears throat> but it's always been understood that when we talked about lifestyle medicine, we don't want to mention certain diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because it was pretty much understood that this was rough. There wasn't a lot to be positive about, and no one was really standing up and saying that you should have a lot of hope. And when we asked people, um, everyone was a little bit uncomfortable making it saying anything too positive. Um, and then uh, I met Steve Blake and he spoke and he was very encouraging and said he's actually seen real progress. And when I spoke to him, <clears throat> I was surprised. It seemed like he wasn't just saying it, he really believed it. And I was really interested and encouraged by that. Um, and then recently when I read Dr. <laughs> Bredesen's book, um, I was again surprised. I really originally read the book with the thinking that you know, this is, I don't know, maybe going to be some positive thinking because I had already decided that Alzheimer's was sort of hope, hopeless a little bit. And this was the most encouraging book by far I've ever read on it. And I really came away feeling like, wow, this is really a lot you can do, a real lot you could do. And I became very excited that Alzheimer's was now part of the discussion. And um, as he continued to write more about it, and wrote, a, wrote case histories about people who've recovered, I realized he was really onto something. He was one of the world's authorities on this topic. He's been doing all the research and he was not just saying maybe, he was saying that yes, um, this, was, this was a real thing that we could make a difference in a big way with Alzheimer's. Um, now Parkinson's, I also considered maybe even more hopeless than Alzheimer's because I've never heard anyone say anything good and when I read Dr. Dorsey's book, again, um, it was a little bit of a surprising book because there was, you know, it was so, it was very clear that our lifestyle 
And our modern world is a significant cause, if not the major cause of Parkinson's. So we're not really just having this panel to give you a pep talk. I'm saying that there was tremendous information in these books that I'm very excited to share with everyone um, to help everyone uh, be more hopeful and more aware of the latest information. So um, Dr. Bredesen's only gonna be here for the first hour. So we'll maybe focus a little more on Alzheimer's at the beginning, um, but all these questions are meant for uh, anyone, whether you wanna talk about Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, we'll try to keep the answers short um, or short, not you know, like to three or four minutes so that we can get through a lot of questions. So I am gonna start with the question. So here we go. Um, first, um, Dr. Bredesen, you made a big, big point of saying you had this thing called, you named it Ketoflex 12-3. What, what were the two, what was this about? Um, what, please tell us about this. Sure. So let me just start by saying, uh, really enthusiastic to be here uh, with this uh, August group here. And, you know, people who are actually trying to make a difference, there's unfortunately so much of kind of the sticking with the 20th century approach to these diseases. And I think you, know, you mentioned lifestyle. It's important to point out, this is not just about lifestyle. This is about fundamental change in the way we interact with patients, going from a situation where we write a single prescription for somebody who's got a very complex illness and that the prescription has nothing to do with why they got the illness, to now in the, in the 21st century, looking at networks, changing in brain networks, whether it's motor modulation as in Parkinson's, whether it's neuroplasticity as in Alzheimer's or other things, and identifying all the critical components in that network and then going after those. And you're absolutely right. Lifestyle is part of it. And so we developed, we're just asked, you know, biochemically, what do you need? And I know Dr. Blake is a real expert in this area. So biochemically, what do you need to optimize your plasticity? And I talked a little bit about this this morning. So you need to have a reduction in inflammation if you've got ongoing inflammation. You've got to have a reduction in ongoing exposure to toxins. You've got to have support for optimal energetics, and that means blood flow and oxygenation and mitochondrial function and actually ketones and glucose, which are the two things your brain is trying to burn. And it means to optimize your trophic support, and that's NGF, BDNF, hormones, nutrients. So again, this is a network. So Ketoflex 12.3 is the name we gave to the diet, but there are lots of good diets. What you want to do is you want to have something that gives you high phytonutrients, things like polyphenols and things that have, that gives you a, uh, a high fiber intake. That's great for your glycemic load. That's great for your lipid status. That's great for your detox and so forth and so on. And of course, it's great for your microbiome. You want to have something that gives you appropriate fasting that makes you metabolically flexible so that you can burn both. Most people with Alzheimer's can't burn either. They're, they're insulin resistant and they're not keto adapted. So they are really having an energy problem. And we call it keto flex because we're, we're trying to drive these people into mild ketosis as Professor Stephen Kinane has shown. Although you have this reduction in glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal lobes, you can still utilize ketones. And he's shown just giving ketones alone is helpful. So we're trying to drive people into ketosis and we're telling them you should have a period of fasting. Now you have to be careful. Alzheimer's disease is fundamentally an insufficiency in that network, but it is born of excess. So in other words, too much sugar, too much exposure to these various toxins and things are what's driving. So you don't wanna to get too much into starving yourself, but you wanna become metabolically flexible. And so 12 hours minimum fast at night, three hours minimum fast before bed. You don't want your insulin to be spiking there. And so that's what we call a keto flex 12 free for that reason. And again, diet is a critical part of the overall addressing of the abnormalities that ultimately lead to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, a lot of good points there. I'm not sure how to raise my hand here. I'll go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, well, good points uh, all the way, Dr. Bredesen. Uh, I will say that uh, ketogenesis let me start with the source of why the brain cells are not getting the glucose in there. Uh, the problem is not that the brain cells can't burn the glucose. The problem is that brain cells can't get the glucose inside the brain cells. 
Normally sure. this is triggered by insulin and the insulin is going to trigger the insulin substrate receptor, which triggers phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase and then protein kinase B. And then finally, the glucose transporter pulls glucose into the brain cell. The reason why all of this doesn't work is because we have too much dietary saturated fat that makes it so we have up to half of the insulin receptors to begin with and interferes, as I believe Dr. Bredesen has, has pointed out prior talk, interferes with the substrate receptor of the insulin that, that docks onto the, the beta end, the internal end of the insulin receptor. So we've really got a lot of problems with getting glucose into the brain, but we can reverse insulin resistance by lowering saturated fats. If this is the case, then we can get glucose to those brain cells and quickly. We're talking about weeks, not a long time. Once this is the case, <laughs> excuse me, then it's really exciting because the brain then can utilize its preferred fuel, which is glucose. Yeah, and, and I should point out also, of course, there's some uh, beautiful work from years ago <laughs> showing that, in fact, the amyloid beta itself, one of its many, many effects is to block the insulin receptor itself. So it actually impairs insulin signaling. So there are you know, multiple effects, as you say. And again, I think with a lot of these things in medicine, there's no perfect, you know, right, wrong answer. If we can get that, if we can get that energetic approach going, that's helpful. Now, is the, you know, is the only way to do it to reduce saturated fat? I don't think so, because I think that you can also add ketones. Again, Professor Kunane has done this very effectively, has published data, has shown improvements in mild cognitive impairment. Just taking someone who has MCI and just adding exogenous ketones. So I think there are, you know, there are multiple ways to address the deficiencies. But I agree with you that fundamentally, this is a network insufficiency that you're trying to address. The energetics, as you say, um, the cells, and you can certainly see that on a PET scan, the cells aren't utilizing glucose as they should. And of course, the cells can't get their glucose not only because of insulin resistance, but because of problems with blood flow to the brain cells. Absolutely. It's also uh, an artifact of eating too much saturated fat and too little of those anti-inflammatory plant foods that you were just talking about. Yeah, so and of we, course- we have a combination of factors. I do wanna also mention though that 12 hours is normal for a liver to produce glucose sufficient to run our brains every night. And that ketosis is unlikely to be achieved in 12 hours. Usually it takes days of fasting to deplete the liver and de novo glucogenesis to really stop. So for these reasons, I would really like to see people getting their insulin resistance down. And of course, it's not just a problem for the brain. It's problems throughout the body. Right. And once you know, we're going to talk about advanced glycation end products and glycated hemoglobin. And that also is a problem with insulin resistance and also can be reversed by getting down to a reasonable intake of saturated fats. Absolutely. I think it's a really good point. I mean, depending on you know, what you're looking for, uh, you know, as Walter Longo has, has shown, it takes a few days before you're actually getting stem cell effects uh, from, you know, from fasting. So there, you're right. There are different times and we typically recommend 12 to 14 hours for APOE4 negative and 14 to 16 hours or even more for people who are APOE4 positive. But you're absolutely right. This is for someone who's been doing this repeatedly. When you start de novo, you, you know, you're, you're dealing with glycogen storage that may, you know, maybe 12 hours, maybe 24 hours, you know, it depends on what your status is. Yes, and that same glycogen storage is interfered with. Once you finally get that glucose into the, the cell, what, any cell in the body, then it needs to be put into glycogen storage, which is, for, for people who aren't familiar with it, thousands of glucose molecules stored as glycogen for an energy reserve, say in muscle cells. So you don't yeah. really need glucose right away when you start running. You've got to, and your brain cells do it too. So, but that is interfered with again by palmitate and other saturated fatty acids that interfere with the storage of glycogen. So interfere with our brain's reserve of glucose. Yeah, and so, you know, I think all these things need to be internally consistent. So, so I guess my question would be, you have someone, Professor Kinane, for example, who's just giving saturated fat. He's given MCT to people who already have MCI. From what I'm understanding from you, they shouldn't be getting better, but he's showing that they do. 
So how does that work when giving a saturated fat to a situation when saturated fat is not supposed to be helpful? It's, it is because just what you said is the brain can burn hydroxybutyrate and acetone. These are the ketones that the brain is burning. Acetone, you remember that, the solvent that was outlawed because it was sure. too toxic. Acetone is a ketone. And the brain can burn that, but it's not a preferred fuel. What happens is, yes, at first, now MCI has several meanings. If you're talking about coconut oil, which is 65% of lauric myristic and palmitic acid, then that's gonna increase the problems of getting glucose into the blood cells. So there may be a temporary ability of the brain cells to utilize the ketones, but with a long-term degradation, by increased insulin resistance and lack of ability to intake and utilize glucose. So the long-term effects are very, very bad, even though temporarily a few ketones might get utilized. And remember, the brain loves glucose. Ketones are a, a secondary source that they're not desired. So my approach would be the safer one reduce insulin resistance, get those brain cells back up and going. And as you mentioned, there are many other approaches that can happen simultaneously to get those brain cells protected. And of course, we want to keep them alive because if they die, then it's all over. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm MCT that he used was caprylic acid. Okay. Let me break this into smaller bite-sized action steps for the audience. So the first thing we're saying though, is that for three or four hours after, so for three or four hours before you go to sleep, don't eat anything. And then the second thing you're saying is that if you eat it, so if you took three or four hours between dinner and going to sleep, then you wanna make sure it's at least 12 to 16 hours between your last meal at night and your first meal in the morning. Is that what we're saying, Dr. Bredesen, is the 12-3 rule? Yes, so exactly. So what we're saying though critically is become metabolically flexible. That's the thing that's missing in most people who have MCI. Okay, so that's the first thing. Then for both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, where do we feel, where, where does, what is exercise's role? Is this, so the first thing we want action step is the 12 and three, three hours, be, eat three or four hours before you go to bed, don't eat for 12 hours between dinner and breakfast. The second thing is for prevention of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, where does exercise, and exercise means aerobics, it also means resistance weight training, where does that fit into this? Well, I'd like to answer that if I may. Brain-derived neurotropic factor is increased by exercise, and brain-derived neurotropic factor allows us to produce more brain cells and more connections between our brain cells. There are other tropic factors too. So this is one of the ways that exercise does that, and exercise, of course, has been found to help tremendously in Parkinson's disease, not only prevention, but in assisting people with Parkinson's disease, experience fewer symptoms. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and you know, multiple mechanisms here because you do create more insulin sensitivity with exercise. That's one of the things that's, that actually is the benefit. Um, as Steve said, of course, you increase your BDNF. Most studies show you know, 10 to 12%, that sort of uh, increase. And of course, there are other things like whole coffee fruit extract that have been shown to increase it as well. Lots of people are interested in increasing BDNF in Alzheimer's disease. Of course, improved blood flow, improved oxygenation, improved sleeping. So absolutely, by multiple mechanisms, mm -hmm. when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and pre-Alzheimer's, and that's, of course, one of our big problems, we diagnosed this so late, we, we call mild cognitive impairment uh, is a relatively late stage of this problem. It's like telling someone they have mildly metastatic cancer. So the, this is one of the big problems. In fact, we d diagnose it so late, but absolutely exercise plays a huge role in best treatment and best prevention. I agree. <laughs> And, and Ray, could you, could you say something about what have you seen with effects of exercise? Because certainly there's been a lot discussed uh, Dr. Zid and his program, for example, and others, what do, what do you see with exercise in your Parkinson's patients? And Dr. Blake as well, what do you see? So as Dr. Blake was indicating, it's helpful to uh, lower your risk of Parkinson's. So vigorous exercise in your 40s, 50s, and 60s can decrease your risk of ever developing Parkinson's by about 20%, equivalent to three and a half to four hours a week of uh, running or swimming. Um, and then numerous studies have demonstrated the benefits of exercise for people with uh, Parkinson's disease, everything from uh, I mean, boxing, where you actually don't have to hit people in the head, but you do vigorous uh, exercise, bicycle riding, 
A study done in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that Tai Chi improved balance and decreased your risk of falls. Yoga, dancing have all been shown to be a, of great benefit uh, for people with Parkinson's. And what does it do for your GDNF? So uh, we're still trying to figure this out. So I think people have to understand that the brain's not so easy to uh, do an assay of. It's hard to assess. You can't go uh, go in the brain and see how it's doing as opposed to like doing an ultrasound of the heart and you can see how the uh, heart is, is functioning. But as Dr. Blake uh, and you were both indicating, it appears that exercise uh, releases uh, growth factors that are protective to nerve cells and maintain uh, synapses uh, that are important in both Alzheimer's disease uh, and Parkinson's. And then my colleague and co-author, Dr. Boss Bloom, just uh, reported some results looking at uh, functional imaging uh, changes in response uh, to exercise that might be suggesting that connectivity might be improved as uh, suggested by both of you. Exciting. It is important that we caution people with Parkinson's disease to get their exercise in a safe manner because falls are so easy yeah. with Parkinson's disease. There are devices that hold people up, say on a treadmill, so they can get some good exercise without any chance of falling whatsoever. So just be careful when you start an exercise program, both for cardiovascular and for fall. Thank no tight ropes. Okay, got it. Okay, what about in terms of sleep's role with Parkinson and Alzheimer's? What is, what's the role of that? Is that important? Well, again, it's uh, in Alzheimer's disease, it's a huge one. Well, again, most of these things have been underappreciated. And so people have typically said, well, you know, lifestyle, fine, lifestyle. But these are all critical pieces to understand what's driving the process. If you have sleep apnea, you are at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. If you have upper airway resistance syndrome, you are at increased risk. There are many people who simply have uh, you know, poor ability to oxygenate at night. There's a beautiful study from a few years ago, simply looking at the mean SpO2 at night versus the size of various nuclei within the brain by volumetric MRI. And there was a beautiful correlation on multiple nuclei, including by the way, hippocampus, which is so critical. So there is a huge role, underappreciated, under-evaluated, not enough people are checking nocturnal oximetry. And I think with the wearables that are becoming more and more common, we're going to see more and more people who are saying, hey, wait a minute, why am I dropping to you know, 85% oxygen saturation while I'm sleeping at night? And that's going to help to reduce the overall uh, incidence. We'd all love to see reduction in the global burden of neurodegenerative to illness. Uh, so Dr. Bredesen, uh, Dr. Macon Neerdegaard from the University of Rochester uh, recently showed that there were changes that happened in the sleep in terms of changes in the lymphatic system that yeah. might be important in memory. Do you want to briefly describe those in layman's terms? Yeah, it's a great point. You actually have a change in the anatomical, you know, the architecture of your brain uh, so that it, you're literally removing things, the so-called glymphatic system, as you mentioned, and this was really pioneering work. Uh, and so, and, and that is basically inhibited by noradrenergic tone. So things that are keeping you awake, things that are keeping you up are actually preventing that process. That process helps to remove things like damaged proteins and damaged lipids and things like that. So in, again, multiple mechanisms, sleep is absolutely critical in cognition. And of course, we're all aware of that when we don't get sleep, that it, it definitely impacts our cognition. And of course, there is, uh, this is one of these things where there's chicken and egg also. Amyloid, just the presence of amyloid in the brain does interfere with sleep patterns. And on the other hand, having poor sleep does lead to more amyloid. So you have this kind of prionic loop phenomenon where each one is unfortunately advancing the other. Um, what about with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's head trauma that maybe you get from, I don't know, you fall, tackle football, boxing? Is this something that affects these illnesses? Yeah, you want to talk about Parkinson's? Yeah, so, uh, well, you know, one of the most famous people that ever had Parkinson's disease was Muhammad Ali, and it's really hard to, to indicate whether uh, what caused any one particular individual's disease, but numerous studies have demonstrated that head trauma increases your risk for Alzheimer's disease, for Parkinson's disease, and probably even more so for Alzheimer's disease. There was a great study looking at uh, NFL football players, I think 111, and the brains of 111 NFL players who died, 110 of them had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, these uh, significant changes in the pathology of the brain, um, wasting away of the brain uh, in essence uh, in these uh, individuals. 
the vast majority of them had memory impairment. Over half of them had uh, features of uh, Parkinsonism. So uh, protect your brain. It's your most important organ. That's, and that's the reason uh, we chose our field. Absolutely. And um, Steve, you want to weigh in on this? Well, traumatic brain injury is definitely damaging to memory. And many people come in our memory clinic with uh, traumatic brain injury. It's uh, definitely a contributor. And it depends where it is, is it a coup contra coup injury or what type of injury it is or various degrees. But traumatic brain injury is extremely common in the military, in sports, as Ray Dorsey mentioned. And it, it is uh, damaging to the brain. And sometimes that damage is permanent. And there's not much we can do about that except avoid accidents. So it's, it's hard to use it as a prevention. Yeah. There was an interesting paper that came out way back in 1985 uh, from Gareth Roberts, who looked at people who had significant head trauma, typically in car accidents, and then died within seven to 10 days or so after the accident. And they had surprisingly massive amounts of amyloid in their brain. So they were. this is something that pours out. It's not only part of the innate immune system, it's also part of the response to neural damage. And so now as we hear, you know, people who are getting this repeatedly, CTE, you end up with very little amyloid. In classic CTE has very little, if any, amyloid. It's really a tauopathy. But I suspect that in many of these cases, you know, you've cleared out these things over the years by the time you end up with classical CTE. With the One of the problems with uh, traumatic brain injury is that if you can treat it right away, you can make some good inroads in it. Yeah. But once time has passed over a few months, it's very difficult. We, we have treatment protocols in, in our clinic for it, but it is easier if you can get it treated right away. So if you are injured in that way, in some senses, traumatic brain injury is like a stroke. Uh, it's better to treat it right away where you can get to it and, and help it out because there may be reperfusion injury, for instance, in head injury where the, the blood is stopped and then all of a sudden rushing into the brain causing a lot of injury. If you had a son in high school, would you let him play tackle football or box? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I would check his APOE status, to be honest. If he were APOE4 positive because they respond more poorly to trauma, um, I would definitely say no. If you were APOE4 negative, I guess I'd ask him, are you trying to play linebacker or are you trying to be, play wide out? It would be a, maybe, a, maybe a little difference there. I think we need to encourage sports uh, for all kids. I mean, just to talk about the benefits of exercise, we need it as society, as parents, as adults to ensure that the sports that we encourage are safe uh, for our children. And I think there are certain sports that uh, currently by their nature are not safe, especially uh, for young children. Yeah. All right, soccer would be a good choice because it's so much safer than tackle football. Yeah. Is, Unless you're doing a lot of headers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there are, and these are easy <laughs> modifications to do. I mean, there were women's soccer players uh, uh, from the World Cup who were talking about, you know, the idea that you're going to head a ball that was kicked 40 feet into the air and use it to redirect it. Maybe that's not the brightest idea in the world. So we can, you know, make changes to our existing sports, make them safer. And so that we can continue to enjoy them. But, you know, some of these things, you know, tackle football at a young age for kids is uh, probably not the wisest idea. Um, is being active an important strategy to employ in trying to prevent and remediate cognitive decline? And what, what does being active mean? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, so absolutely, being active is very important. And I think you know, many, many studies have come to the same conclusion. Now, as far as what that means, that is a, that's a very good point because you have people who will just do a little walking. Yes, it's better than nothing, but you really do uh, want to get your heart rate up. You really want to get the blood flow. As Steve was, was referring to earlier, blood flow is critical. You know, the, these people typically aren't having enough support for their brains, and that includes blood flow and oxygenation and mitochondrial function, uh, as well as their trophic support. So um, yes, staying active, very helpful in general, but we'd love to see people get somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes, somewhere you know, three to seven times a week uh, of having significant uh, activity and getting their heart rate up to, you know, getting up to 70% of maximal. 
uh, for, you know, for that period of time, uh, whether you're doing it through, you know, Peloton or whether you're doing it through a hit or whether you're doing it through something else. One of the interesting things that's come up, I, I mentioned, you know, EWAT this morning, but that's one of the ones that's actually been pretty interesting. And another one is these restriction bands with some of the, which uh, some of the Olympic athletes used, um, which reduce blood flow a little bit to the limbs and basically you respond. So you get a little more bang for your buck in terms of the uh, improvement with that amount of exercise. Yeah, and activity is not just about physical activity too. What is very helpful to reduce risk of Alzheimer's disease and progression is social activity where people are interacting with each other. And this is to be encouraged. It's also very helpful with Parkinson's disease where you have, for instance, ballroom dancing which has been found in many studies to be really helpful. And first of all, it's hard to fall down if someone's holding you up. And second of all, there's a lot of uh, interrelation going on between people. And then you're getting some good exercise too. I don't know if you can quite get up to 70% of your uh, maximal uh, blood, but maybe. Um, we started out and you said that overnight, it was good to fast for 12 hours, 12 to 16 hours. What about longer fasts, fasts that are like um, a 48 hour fast, a weekly fast, a several week fast, and you and would that be with green juice or with water? And is, is there a benefit to longer term, meaning from one day to three weeks of either water fasting or green juice fasting? Is there any information, studies or science on this for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? Yeah, Steve, you wanna comment on this? Yes, um, fasting is an art and a science, and it, there's something called Buchinger fasting, which is highly developed in Europe, and it's actually, they're taking in about 200 calories per day uh, from uh, juices, freshly made juices, mostly vegetable juices, keep the glycemic load down, and also broths and teas, and this has been done in metabolic wards as well as at home. It's been studied quite a lot, and what's very protective about this type of fasting is the large amount of antioxidants that are being taken while a person is fasting. Now, Ray Dorsey, I'm sure would agree that our fat cells have gotten some of these persistent organic pollutants into them. And while we're fasting, we're burning our fat cells and these persistent organic pollutants get into our bloodstream. It's very nice to have some antioxidants and anti-inflammatories in there to stop them. I am not a proponent of water fasting. It's uh, known as starvation fasting. And I think in the 70s, it pretty much was shown that it was inferior as far as protecting people during the fast. Uh, certainly you get fast results with water fasting, but it's also much more dangerous. So fasting with the broths, the juices and the teas, the broths are very nice. Like a potato broth is very alkalinizing to the body, which the bloodstream tends to try to become more acidic during a fast. And it's very nice to have this soothing broth along with it. So I would suggest that if people are going to fast that they do that. However, in Parkinson's disease, especially in the later stages, we have weight loss as one of the big problems. So you would not wanna fast if you were already low in weight, of course. Yeah, and if I could just add, um, I think this is a field unto itself, as Steve alluded to. Uh, there are a lot of variables, a lot of issues. And again, we see Alzheimer's as a network insufficiency ultimately. And so taking a system that does not have enough support, whether it's oxygenation, vascular flow, mitochondria, you know, all these things, and then saying, now well, let's remove the support for it, that is a really scary thing. So where we find it most helpful is in people who are a little overweight and they have some degree of insulin resistance and we're helping them to become insulin sensitive and we're helping them to become metabolically flexible. That's where I think it can be very, very helpful. Of course, it has good uh, effects on things like blood pressure, for example, stem cells, for example. So there are some good things and you might consider the fasting mimicking diet that Walter Longo developed. I think that's a, a reasonable thing to consider. Um, yeah, as Steve mentioned, making sure that you have some antioxidants on board, very helpful. So we are very careful about that for people who have low BMIs. Uh, if, you, you know, if you're down at nine, you know, 19, 18 BMI, I am very worried about having you be fasting. I'd rather see you kind of slowly work up to it. And again, start with some exogenous support and then ultimately move to where you can do this, you know, truly what is intermittent fasting, although I realize that's a 
controversial term because you know we're all we're all fasting right now. We're all intermittently fasting, uh, but we're talking about a little longer than you know than your typical amount. So I do think it is a field unto itself, and you have to be very careful and look at what's again what's driving your neurodegenerative process before you decide just overall this is the cure all for neurodegeneration. And to go one step further, I what I would like to see is people move toward a nice plant whole food diet. And that's going to provide the benefits of fasting. Some of the best benefits of fasting are not getting the animal foods in the diet. And of course, in the Butchinger system, as any well-developed fasting system, you want to slowly decrease your dependence on heavy foods before you begin the fast and then break the fast very gently with the lightest of foods and then gradually return hopefully not to your prior diet, but to one that's a little bit lighter than your prior diet. For me, I would prefer that people start changing their diet to a much healthier diet. And one of the problems with fasting is the lack of fiber. And even with 200 calories a day and with juices, there's not much fiber in there. And that increases inflammation because it is fiber that drives our microbiota to make the short chain fatty acids that feed the inside of our large intestine cells that is necessary to reduce inflammation in the gut. And as we all know about the gut brain axis. Yeah. And is, there, is there a role for fasting in Parkinson's? Stephen knows probably way more than I do. I, I really just haven't seen that much, but I, I just don't know. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, um, how does Parkinson's compare to Alzheimer's and how fast it's growing? And can you just use the drug levodopa, does that work? Does that solve the problem? So uh, uh, Alzheimer's is about five to 10 times more common. So in the United States, uh, there's about 1.2 million individuals who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. There are about 6 million with Alzheimer's disease. Said another way, one out of every 50 Americans, uh, we have you know nearly 200 people participating right now, four people on average will have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. One in 50 Americans today has Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. A disease, a brain disease is the leading source of disability in the world, more than heart disease, more than infectious diseases, more than COVID, more than cancer. Um, the second question was, what was the second part of the question, Steve? Uh, can you just take levodopa? Does oh. that solve the problem? Well, you know, uh, I was, uh, you know, American medicine is really good at saying diagnosis and what treatment. And usually the first treatment usually people are trained to think about is what medicine. So yes, uh, Parkinson's disease is loss of dopamine producing nerve cells in the brain. Mm -hmm. And the most effective medicine and a godsend for many people is levodopa. But all medications have their uh, side effects, including levodopa. And there are lots of other things that we should be considering. One, to prevent ourselves from ever getting disease in the first places. Cures are hard to come by. They're costly, they're disfiguring, and they're toxic. It's way easier to never have a disease in the first place than it is to uh, treat or cure a disease once you have it. Um, so in addition to medications for people with Parkinson's disease, we've mentioned uh, diet, the Mediterranean diet, high in fruits and vegetables, low in animal products, protecting your head. Uh, we mentioned exercise. And I think one thing we really haven't talked about at all, a big issue for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is air pollution. There was a study that just came out, uh, I think the last couple of weeks, uh, Dale or Dr. Blake will help me out with this and PLOS Medicine showing that improvements in air pollution were associated with slower uh, rates of decline in cognition among people with Alzheimer's disease. I'll say that again. A lot of studies on Alzheimer's and air pollution have come out worldwide. Some of the best ones from China because they have some of the best pollution. Yeah, so improvements in air pollution can actually might be able to slow the rate of decline in air pollution the evidence, as, as Steve, Dr. Blake was just indicating, is really increasing for the role in Alzheimer's disease and increasing not as much uh, for its role in uh, Parkinson's disease. I think it's also a very potent way of entry into the brain. You're inhaling toxins that are in the air that are hitchhiking, including heavy metals that are hitchhiking on the tiny pieces of dust and soot that you see in smog in LA. And those things are going into your, uh, into your nose. Some are small enough to get past your normal ways of sneezing or uh, coughing and they enter your brain and into your uh, nerve cell that's responsible for smell and go back to the smell center, which is among the first areas that's affected in both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I would like to mention that there is another treatment for Parkinson's disease right. besides levodopa, carbidopa. And that is by reducing protein to needed levels rather than excessive levels. And studies have shown quite a few of them 
a researcher, a neurologist in Italy, Luciana Baroni, has published some great studies. One study is fascinating. Uh, they took a group of people and they've already changed their diet to where they were eating a low protein breakfast and lunch. They were down to 67 grams of protein a day. Now adults need about 46. So during the study, half of them lowered their protein down to 49. And the amazing thing was that the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale was twice as good and results did not take long at all. Also the Hone and Yar scale improved by about double. So this is a fantastic way to treat people. It's very effective. It's effective in the short term and the long term. And the reason is because levodopa is made in all of our bodies with or without Parkinson's disease. It's made from tyrosine through the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. And tyrosine is an amino acid that when you eat a lot of protein in a meal, much more than you need, which is what Americans do at every meal. Americans tend to eat 50 grams each meal of, of protein. They only need 50 grams in a day. And this excess amino acids interfere with the only transporter into the bloodstream, the large neutral amino transporter. Also from the bloodstream more critically into the brain, the large neutral amino acid transporter is clogged like a rush hour traffic. And the tyrosine can't get into the brain to make through tyrosine hydroxylase, make levodopa. Now this occurs both in people with Parkinson's disease and without. So you're effectively increasing their levodopa that's made in their body by reducing their protein. This reduces symptoms just as if you'd given them more levodopa. It also is fantastic, increases the levodopa effect on the person. Now we all know that you shouldn't give levodopa at the same time as a large meal, right? That's standard advice but it is the protein that interferes with the transport of levodopa as well as the tyrosine. So you're interfering in two different ways with our ability to make dopamine by having the usual excess of protein instead of just the amount that you need. And there are of course many diets for more advanced Parkinson's that we have developed. Uh, my wife has a cookbook for Parkinson's where you can get plenty of calories, but not too much protein so that you are able to cut your symptoms in half. Okay, let me ask you um, a big question. So um, there's been a lot of uh, people have mentioned that uh, Alzheimer's, they call it type three diabetes. I don't know if that's accurate or they're just trying to be using that expression, but the implication is that you <clears throat> treat Alzheimer's prevention the way you would diabetes and not let your blood sugar get too high. So the three part question is one, what is the ideal diet for preventing Alzheimer's? And I don't know if there is one for Parkinson's. Number two, does the ideal diet include whole food plant-based fats, meaning raw seeds, raw nuts, avocados, raw olives, and even possibly oils like hemp, flax, and chia? And then part three is where does fruit fit into this? They got a whole bunch of whole food plant-based people saying fruit is great. And then you have Brian Clement at Hippocrates saying, look, I've been looking at blood under the microscope for 20 years and fruit is feeding yeast mold, fungus and cancers. And therefore, if you're fighting diabetes or Alzheimer's, you don't want sugar, which means you don't want fruit. And that's not what most people are saying. So it's what's the diet, is whole, is whole food fat, seeds, nuts, avocados, olives, okay. And what about fruit? And we're talking about how to prevent Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's. That's the question. I'd love to jump in on this one, if you don't mind. Uh, as far as fruit goes, when you look at glycemic load, and it's unfortunate that many doctors are still using glycemic index, which is extremely inaccurate. But when you look at glycemic load, uh, I know that Brian Clement doesn't want blood sugars to go too high, but we also don't want them to go too low. Blood sugar should be maintained somewhere in the range of 70 to 90 milligrams per deciliter. This is the optimum range. So if you eat whole fruit, not fruit juice, not dried fruit, but whole fruit, and if its glycemic load isn't too high, most fruits are in there. Apples, pears, berries, these are all in the low glycemic load range. They will slowly absorb and keep your blood sugar at the optimal level without exceeding the amount if, of course, you don't have insulin resistance to the point that people with diabetes already do. As far as the fats and oils in whole intact foods, you mentioned avocados, great. Nuts and seeds, great. The only nut that I would not recommend would be coconut. 
uh, because of the lack of vitamin E and the excesses of saturated fats. But otherwise, these whole fats are great. I do not encourage extracted fats like oils uh, instead of chia oil or something. Uh, ground flaxseed are a great source of omega-3 fatty acids. They're very helpful. And what was the first part? <laughs> A uh, fruit fat, and what's the overall diet you're recommending? Well, for prevention of Alzheimer's disease, you would want to have a diet that supplies all of your essential nutrients, vitamins and minerals, as well as the correct amount of fats, but not just the correct amount of fats, but the correct fats. Humans only need two essential fatty acids, linoleic, the omega-6, and alpha-linolenic, the omega-3. Other than that, adult humans have no requirement for saturated fat or EPA or DHA or any other fat. And as far as EPA or DHA goes, well, they can improve our cardiovascular risk, but they may also increase our cancer risk because of pollutants and rancidity. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. So algal oil would be a better choice. In my book, Fats and Oils Demystified, I have a whole chapter on how we can convert the plant-based omega-3 into EPA and DHA. So the, I would say the, the best diet is going to be a whole food plant diet, but carefully chosen. So each of the nutrients is present. And I do think that normally diets need to be supplemented for several reasons, and mostly because I analyze diets and I see that each diet I analyze may be deficient in say zinc but zinc is necessary for superoxide dismutase to protect our brains. And that, that is true for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. If we don't have copper or manganese or selenium, we can't, our endogenous antioxidants don't work. Superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase. So we may need to take some supplements along with this whole plant diet in order to get everything we need to keep our brain sharp, especially folate and vitamin B12. Those are crucial for creating s adenosyl methionine, known as SAMe, which methylates or quenches those very genes that create the secretase enzyme so that they don't create them. It's epigenetically stopping this. I, I don't want to talk too long. You can tell I'm enthusiastic, but it's a great <laughs> question. Well, and this is your area of expertise, which is fantastic to have here. Let me just ask if I could one question while we have you here. So uh, as you know, Rick Johnson has uh, put out a lot of very interesting work on uric acid and relationship of fructose to uric acid. And his argument is that a potentially important contributor to Alzheimer's may be fructose because of the way it's metabolized, because of this reduction in mitochondrial function, reduction in ATP. Do you think it is, for, now of course you've pointed out the really exciting part about, yes, you get all this wonderful fiber as well. And of course, all sorts of phytonutrients as well. But what about, you know, is this an area, is this a concern if you've got people who are taking too much fructose in terms of their potential for cognitive decline? Well, yes and no. Yes, if it's high fructose corn syrup in a drink and they're guzzling tons of it, and definitely yeah. no if they're eating a piece of whole intact organic fruit. This is a really a big difference. So we can do that. We can handle that. Now, you mentioned uric acid. And I think it's very interesting that uric acid, we all think of gout, right? When we say yeah, uric acid. Did you know that uric acid is a very important antioxidant in our systems? Absolutely. And it helps to protect our brain and all of our, our bodies. One of the reasons why dairy products are so damaging with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease is that dairy products suppress uric acid in the body. So we're losing one of our important antioxidants. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, and of course, Bruce Ames showed years ago that if you look at the loss of antioxidants in the blood as you now start to insult, uric acid is one of the first ones to disappear. So it's one of the first ones used up and therefore likely to be a critical one, as Bruce showed you know, many, many years ago. So I absolutely agree. And so it's interesting to me, there's this paradox with uric acid where it's on the one hand a protectant, and of course, people with gout had on average higher IQs that was supposed to be attributed to this protective effect, whether that's true or not, don't know. But on the other hand, where his, his argument would be that the way it's metabolized is associated with hypertension, is associated with, you know, with salt, is associated with, uh, you know, with many of the diseases of aging, you know, arthritis, cognitive decline, and things like that. So there is this interesting paradox. And if you just do the epidemiology, of course, people with high uric acid are, have a slight protection 
from cognitive yeah. decline. That's right. uh, so there's a, there's a real paradox there, I think, in terms of uric acid. And we need people like you who really understand nutrition to understand and to, to explain to us this paradox. Well, it's that the antioxidants all work together. It's all of them, the exogenous antioxidants, you know, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, they work together with our internal antioxidant enzymes and uric acid is one of them as, as well as catalase and, um, and ubiquinone too, yeah. uh, coenzyme Q10. All of these work together. And in our Hawaii dementia prevention trial, which I wrote and ran and then wrote the paper in the book, Nutrients for Memory afterwards, this is a randomized controlled trial. And we were able to take people from, well, we, they were 19 on the mini mental state exam, okay, just barely into dementia. Yeah. And within three months, they were up to 27. They dropped wow. in the next three months to 26.5. And in the next, at the end of the nine month trial, they were up to 29 out of 30. Wow. Because we use 16 different interventions, many of which encourage antioxidants. But antioxidants are more of a long-term prevention of Parkinson's disease because they protect, of course, dopaminergic cells too, and, and, and the hippocampus and all the other areas of the brain. More short-term effects are also seen with, with other of our approaches there. Yeah. One, one additional thought on a diet is uh, I get concerned about what's either on what I'm eating or what's in what I'm eating and uh, especially nerve toxins like pesticides. So there's this one pesticide called Paraquat, uh, increases the risk of Parkinson's by 150%, uh, most widely used, one of the most widely used herbicides in the country, uh, 30 countries, including China have banned it, but the US hasn't. You know, it's used on corn, it's used on uh, grapes, it's used on uh, other um, uh, foods that we eat. Another pesticide called chlorpyrifos, EPA finally banned it last year, but widely used on Washington state apples. Uh, a study done in France looked at all the French wines that were produced and every single bottle of French wine that they tested, basically the consumer reports of France found that uh, detectable levels of pesticides in every single one of them. Now they, now they were still low, but it's still a little bit concerning that even the organic wines had detectable levels <laughs> of uh, pesticides uh, found in them. And then, you know, some of these pesticides get concentrated throughout the food train. Many of them are uh, food chain, many are fat soluble so that when you drink fatty substances then they can have pesticides in them. And you know, as you know, most people know the brain is very fatty. So that these fat uh, soluble pesticides could be making our way into the brain. And indeed studies have uh, found remnants of these pesticides in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. So wash your fruits and vegetables uh, and buy organic uh, and uh, tell your congressman and, uh, to signed Senator Cory Booker's uh, bill that would ban uh, Paraquat. I wish that it were enough to buy organic and wash your yeah. vegetables, but it's not. Because as you know, the persistent organic pollutants, the organochlorines, the polychlorinated biphenyls, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, DDT and its breakdown product, DDE, these are all lipophilic, fat loving, and they are bioaccumulated, as you just mentioned, in the food chain. And they are bioaccumulated. So if you get a grass fed cow, who's eating grass that has never been sprayed, organic. That grass has detectable levels of these in it and the cow bioaccumulates them. And then you get a human eating either the milk or the meat of the cow, it bioaccumulates as you mentioned in the fattiest area of the body, which is the brain. So that this bioaccumulation occurs in animal fat but does not occur of course in plant fat because they just grow once. And so unfortunately buying organic is not enough when it comes to animal products it, it's not helpful enough. I, I wish it were, but definitely buy organic everywhere else. And could you guys weigh in on one other thing? If, if I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize for jumping in here, Steve, but I just would love to hear from the two experts here. One of the things that's come up recently is that a, a toxicologist has written me a few times saying that she is seeing uh, patients who, who are developing either Parkinson's or ALS and these are people where when she looks at multiple factors, they don't seem to have a lot of things that, that are associated with this. The one thing she finds is very high levels of glyphosate. And of course, others have said uh, glyphosate is relatively non-toxic, don't worry about it. So what's your sense about this? Uh, are, is this uh, statistically or epidemiologically associated with neurodegenerative conditions? 
Uh, glyphosate is closely associated with certain specific cancers, and there have been lawsuits won on this. So we know yeah. that it does have some terrible dangers to it. I have not seen research with glyphosate on the brain. Glyphosate is not a fat-loving uh, organic pollutant that's uh, persistent. Uh, yeah. Okay, it kind of goes away after you, you use it. But one thing uh, with ALS and Alzheimer's disease that is a possibly a problem is BMAA. It's beta yeah. methyl L amino, uh, let's see, <laughs> it's a alanine. tough one. <laughs> L alanine, that's it. Yeah. Uh, beta methyl amino L alanine. Uh, BMAA is found in, uh, from algae, certain toxic algae, and it's found in especially bottom crawlers like crabs and shrimp and those things. And people who live near bodies of water like that have higher incidence of both Alzheimer's disease and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So that may be a link for those two people right there, although there are many other toxic links in the world. And uh, Ray Dorsey will be happy to know this one's not man-made. Well, not exactly. <laughs> Some of those algae blooms are man-made. Um, so uh, pesticides have been linked to both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, and it's not all pesticides have been linked. And the list of pesticides is hundreds, thousands. Uh, glyphosate, I'm not sure. Um, I think glyphosate might be just a marker for other pesticides that are being used, and it might be interact. There could be interactions uh, with them. Many of the pesticides that are most linked to Parkinson's uh, target the energy producing parts of cells called mitochondria. The dopamine producing nerve cells in uh, Parkinson's disease are these gigantic uh, cells that have a million different dendrites, and they're basically just big bags of mitochondria. So they're really, really susceptible to uh, toxins that target the energy producing parts of cells, of which many of these uh, pesticides are. So certain of these pesticides are linked to Parkinson's, they're linked to ALS. Um, they're found, you know, they're found on turf. So, you know, football players might be getting Parkinson's disease from uh, getting head trauma, that they also might be getting Parkinson's disease and ALS from the pesticides that are on the fields in which they've been playing for the last 30 years. Um, Dr. Bredesen, just to go back to the diet question, um, in terms of fruit and in terms of beans and grains, all three of them can affect your blood sugar. Um, are you concerned when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention, if you're trying to keep your blood sugar down, are you concerned that those foods, those healthy whole food plant-based foods in some way raise blood sugar to a point that would concern you or is yeah. that? It's a well, great point. And we haven't yeah. really talked about CGM yet. We haven't talked about uh, continuous glucose monitoring, which I think is turning out to be very, very helpful because you can not only look at the spikes that people are getting when they're eating various things like, you know, they're eating you know, healthy oatmeal, things like that. Um, they're also, it's also showing that they're dropping into troughs. And we have people all the time who are finding out, oh my gosh, you know, I, I woke up at 3 a.m. with a glucose of 45. So I do think that CGM is changing the way we think about this. And you're right, again, comes back to what Steve was saying earlier. You know, you really have to kind of go person by person. This is a thing where it depends on who you are, what you're doing. Some people do very well uh, with legumes and thing, things, beans and things like that. Other people, uh, can have uh, autoimmune related issues as uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry has reported. Uh, and, but, but again, some, for some people it's excellent and it's part of a, uh, you know, of a low uh, meat or non-meat uh, diet. Uh, and certainly Dean Ornish has written a lot about uh, these sorts of diets. So again, I think it depends on the person. Some people do much better. In general, we stay away from grains, dairy, simple carbs, just because those are all associated uh, with, uh, with an increased risk for cognitive decline. Well, I do look at grains a little bit more finely, and there are some grains such as quinoa uh, at, that are very slowly absorbed. And I'm not concerned about so much a spike in blood sugar. I want blood sugar to be in the good range, as you mentioned. We don't want it too low. We don't right. want it too high. We want it to say 70 to 90, that's perfect. So our brains can function. We can take our, our neuropsychological tests and come out fine, and we can keep that going. And it, it is a cause of concern for brain cell death, whether dopaminergic or in the hippocampus, that we don't have enough sugar. And you can actually initiate excitotoxicity, which is relevant both for epilepsy and migraines. A little off topic for this. We do look at beans as far as their glycemic load go extremely slow so that as your body's utilizing glucose all the time from your blood 
and the beans slowly put glucose into your blood, it's at a point where your body doesn't need to insert insulin or glucagon at all. It's being maintained just fine with the beans themselves. And for diabetics, beans are perfect because they never create a spike in blood sugar. No matter how you process them, they don't. Grains, of course, is harder because most grains are real junk. When, when you take wheat and you make it into white flour, you're removing 86% of the manganese. That's a, magnesium, excuse me. That's a really important nutrient. And you're also stripping other minerals, vitamin E and other things out of these white rice and white. Did you know that how the first vitamin was discovered? Thiamine was discovered when they first polished rice in Japan. No one ever had a deficiency until they polished rice. They didn't know it existed. So it's, it's not that all carbs are bad. For instance, uh, purple sweet potatoes have a nice slow absorption. They're very healthy. They have anthocyanins. They're really good food. There are some people who can't handle them. And then as far as wheat goes, we have gliadin, which can be actually neuroactive. Uh, with autistic kids, some of them, if you take away the wheat, they become much less autistic and their behavior becomes much better. So it, that can be a problem. And I certainly agree with you that uh, dairy is not an acceptable food for the brain. And uh, I know that Dr. Dorsey has looked at heptachlor in dairy products and many other organochlorines are concentrated bioaccumulated in milk, even organic milk. And that these are very toxic, especially to those very sensitive dopaminergic cells, but also our other brain cells create a uh, higher risk of cancer and are just, and, and they reduce uric acid as, as we mentioned before. There's many reasons not to eat dairy products, but we need, do need to keep our calcium up. So there, the nuts and the beans are gonna improve our calcium in our diet. So they have a place there. Thank you. Um Regarding supplements, nutritional supplements, um, this is an area where a lot of us are confused. We've definitely hear certain supplements are thrown around a lot, like get vitamin D, get DHA, EPA, get vitamin C. What is your exact list for someone who says, I do not want Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, they're very scary. What is the exact list of supplements from one to 15 that you were saying, <laughs> your research is saying is the most important supplements that we should all be taking for the prevention of these two? Uh -oh. Oh, may I? <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I would say that because 93% of Americans are below the bare minimum on vitamin E, that vitamin E is an excellent supplement to take. Unfortunately, uh, the vitamin E on the market is not real vitamin E at all. It's synthetic alpha tocopherol, a mixture of eight different elements that look like alpha tocopherol, but only one is real, the other seven are fake. So if you're talking about supplementing vitamin E, what we did in our trial was we had people eat an ounce of walnuts and an ounce of, for gamma tocopherol and an ounce of sunflower seeds for the alpha tocopherol. This is the real deal. We also found real vitamin E, which is very expensive and hard to find, virtually impossible in a supplement. But I do think vitamin E would be at the top of my list. Also vitamin C, which is also very important. And vitamin C, as you know, recharges vitamin E. Vitamin E will implant in a neuron and protect it. But once it's reduced one free radical, it needs vitamin C to recharge it so it can continue. So those two would be at the top of my list of supplements. Vitamin D is also very essential and, and low in many diets. And if you do get enough vitamin D, you're likely to get a lot of toxins along with it. So vitamin D would be an excellent D3 and uh, probably range of 1,000 to 4,000 IUs a day, which is 25 to 100 micrograms in the more modern terminology. So those are a few. Uh, also zinc, manganese, selenium, and copper uh, are needed uh, in supplements every day. Again, with those trace minerals, you don't want too much and you don't want too little and you want the exact right form. Selenium should be selenomethione and so on. So you want the right form and the right amounts of those things. We actually produced, we had a lot of people in our trial and we had trial supplements, but people outside the trial couldn't get those. So we produced a brain and body food supplement that has most of the things in the trial, including everything I mentioned. We're actually able to get the real vitamin E at double the cost uh, in there. So as far as other supplements, um, Quenzyme Q10 would be a nice one. 
it's difficult for our bodies to make it when we age. It's a crucial antioxidant. And you've mentioned the mitochondria several times. It is absolutely essential for the electron transport chain to function at all for aerobic energy production. It's named ubiquitin because it is found in every cell. But again, the form is important, ubiquinol or ubiquinone. You want ubiquinol. It's a better form of it. Uh, I could go on, but I, I don't want to talk too long. But anyway, there's my top five or 10 for you of supplements. And, oh, vitamin B12 and folate. Don't forget those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're all finding the same thing. Humans are complex organisms. You need to make the whole system work together. And so the idea that there is a list, everybody take these five or 10 or 15 or 20 supplements, really misses the whole point. We're trying to optimize the neurochemistry and the biochemistry for everybody. So for people who have high vitamin D levels that are out in the sun all the time and really don't need more vitamin D, they don't necessarily need to take it. For those of us you know, who are, having, who are low, um, we certainly may want to add it. So, and then of course, as we've heard many times, soils have changed, microbiomes are different. So it's gonna be a little bit different for each person. Now, having said that, there are some, just as, and I would agree with many of the ones that Steve mentioned, um, I happen to like uh, I happen to like omega threes, and I think how how you get it, you know, if you can get it from fatty fish, that's fine. But certainly, the work from Professor Workman from MIT would argue that a combination of DHA and citicoline is actually quite helpful for people um, and supports synaptic formation. Um, and then in general, and as Steve mentioned, you know, we're deficient. We're, most of us are deficient in zinc, about a billion people worldwide. M many people deficient in magnesium, many people deficient in iodine, many, many people deficient mm -hmm. in potassium. So these are relatively common things. Choline is another one. And of course, our omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, which should be much closer to, you know, three to one or something like this. Mm -hmm. Many of us are 15 to one, 20 to one. Uh, so we often do have too much of the pro-inflammatory omegas and too little of the anti-inflammatory omegas. So I do like some DHA and some EPA. And I do, I also like whole coffee fruit extract uh, because it is another way to help increase your BDNF. Um, and then I think, you know, there's a whole armamentarium um, that the Ayurvedic physicians have taught us about. And, you know, we should take advantage of those when, you know, when they're useful, things like Bacopa that can be, can be quite helpful, Ashwagandha under the right circumstances, Shangpushpi, and there's a whole, again, this is thousands of years old uh, literature showing that, the, you know, these, that, that this can help cognition. So I, I think those are, you know, s some of my favorites um, that, I, and again, for people who have plenty of those particular systems working, not so important. But for many of us who are deficient in the various things that Steve mentioned, absolutely, I think, critical to get this optimized. Dr. Dorsey, any supplements that you've studied or feel want to add to the list? Uh, I'll defer to my colleagues who have more expertise than I do. Studies in Parkinson's largely haven't been uh, terribly uh, exciting in terms of uh, finding good things to help people once they have the disease but clearly we need more research and thinking about ways to prevent the disease from happening in the first place. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, one big part of your book and one thing that was kind of outrageous was you spent a lot of time in your book talking about TCE, trichloroethylene, uh, paraquat, um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, chloro something. Or pure uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, can you tell us the story of these? What's going on? What, where do these come from? Why do they exist? How much do you feel they're involved with Parkinson's? Uh, is this just a minor thing or a major thing? Tell us why you, um, what you found about these. Yeah, so I think they're a major thing. Uh, Parkinson's disease was 200 years ago when Dr. James Parkinson described it in London Rare. He said, I'm describing something. He was 62 years old, by the way. So if you're 62, you're not going to write about something unless it's really getting you pissed off or something catches your eye. And he says, I'm describing something that's not been classified in the medical literature. So he's the son of a physician. He's a physician himself. He's saying that I'm describing something that hasn't been classified in the medical literature. 200 years later, exactly 200 years later, is the world's fastest growing brain disease. So how do you go from something that's rare to something that's the world's fastest growing brain disease in 200 years? It can't be genetics. It has to be in the environment. And all these environmental toxins, many of these pesticides and this chemical called trichloroethylene, very simple, six <laughs> atoms. Uh, two carbons in black, one hydrogen in white, and three chlorines, <laughs> hence its name in green. 
<laughs> are all target the energy producing parts of cells called mitochondria. And in the year 2000, uh, one of my uh, colleagues and co-author, uh, Dr. Todd Scheer and others wrote this uh, powerful uh, paper identifying that a naturally occurring pesticide, rotenone, uh, also a mitochondrial toxin, uh, reproduced the features of Parkinson's when fed to laboratory animals. These things are around us everywhere. I told you Paraquat is uh, found on throughout the United States. Its uh, use is, exceeds 15 million pounds. Use in the United States has uh, more than doubled in the last uh, five years. Uh, trichloroethylene, uh, two pounds per person were produced in the 1970s, uh, using everything from decaffeinating coffee to dry cleaning to degreasing. A study in Italy found that uh, found three quarters of people had TCE in their urine. If you used whiteout, if you used, if you drank Sanka coffee, if you used a, a, a carpet cleaner, if you were in Silicon Valley, if you're one of 10 million Americans who worked with this chemical, um, you've likely been exposed uh, to TCE. It's found in half of Superfund sites throughout the United States, found in thousands of other sites, including three at, that I know of in the city of Rochester, including one 15 minutes from my house in my nice suburban uh, Rochester. It's, I didn't know about it until I read, uh, until I was doing the research for the book. You know, we're not even taught about it uh, in uh, medical school. My guess is Dale's probably never even heard of it. And he was trained at the best medical schools in, in the country, if not the world. Uh, but these chemicals are around us and they're fueling the rise of uh, Parkinson's disease. And this one uh, also causes uh, as a known carcinogen and causes liver, kidney uh, cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and prostate cancer. And I learned about it from your book. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, and perchloroethylene as well. And the whole list that you gave in the book, which was really fantastic. And I'd love to see a list that has, here are the ones that actually impact, you know, uh, complex one more than the others. Because I think this is, again, things that are unrecognized. People show up to the doctor, they have Parkinson's, they say, we don't know why you got it. And we should know why you've got it. And, and um, I'll, I'm going to apologize now. i got to sign off at this point. But I, I really appreciate Fantastic to hear the questions. Fantastic to, to be with these experts here. And thank you so much uh, for putting together this wonderful conference. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Bradson. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Take care, guys. Uh, so continuing then. Um, so, Dr. Dorsey, just why is this available? And if you're saying that this stuff is <laughs> that you're reading science, that's clearly correlating with health conditions, in this case, Parkinson's, with specific, um, let's call pesticides, chemicals. Um, you're just saying that that's just how it is. No one has the power to um, change anything. The government, the government agencies, the EPA, this is a prof big profitable industries and no one has an interest in changing anything. So we just let it go into our food and our water and that's that. Is that what's oh. happening? So one, I don't think it's just correlation. So if you feed this uh, to mice or rats in a the laboratory, they develop the pathological features of uh, Parkinson's disease. So you look at their brains, they look like they have Parkinson's disease. Some even develop a little tremor in their paws when you feed this to them. Likewise with Paraquat, you feed it to laboratory animals and they develop the clinical and pathological features of uh, Parkinson's disease. Even when you feed this to mice, they start becoming less um, active, they walk less. Um, so I think it goes beyond just correlation. More research is needed, but I think it's more than that. Uh, and then we've changed the world uh, before. Um, you know, we don't have chlorofluorocarbon is destroying our ozone layer uh, anymore. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have seatbelts, we have airbags. Uh, it just takes uh, people to find their voice and say enough of this nonsense. Uh, who's holding the EPA accountable? Uh, I've never seen a million people with Parkinson's disease march on, in Washington, D.C. at the EPA. I, I don't, um, we've seen that done for HIV. We saw a national quilt uh, cover the, uh, the national, I'm sorry, memorial quilt cover the National Mall. And the, at the same time, there was no federal response to HIV. Today, HIV receives $3 billion per year of research funding. HIV is preventable. There are many people on, listening and to hear who don't have HIV because of the uh, heroism and courage of HIV activists that were part of ACT UP and changed the course of HIV. We need to do the same thing for brain diseases. If we do that, we'll change the course of brain diseases, not just for us, but for future generations. Boy, I'd sure love to see that happen. And I 100% agree with you. Trichloroethylene is a nasty, persistent chemical. It should have been banned long ago. And I have no idea how it could not be. 
But I, I do remember also that Dr. Bredesen mentioned fatty fish, and that made me think of polychlor uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. And we know that polychlorinated biphenyls were outlawed in 1977, but they're still persistent in the environment. And they were replaced by polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are every bit as bad. Both of these really seem to damage tyrosine hydroxylase, which damages our ability to make levodopa in our brains. And they've been very closely associated with Parkinson's disease. What have you seen about PCBs and other uh, organochlorine pesticides and their relationship to that. Now, unfortunately, these can't be withdrawn because they're already in the environment and they're already banned. Yeah, so some of these things live on, like uh, as Dr. Blake was indicating, DDT is still found, it was banned, I think 1970, still found uh, in the environment. Uh, and some of these are fat soluble, some of these pesticides like organochlorines yeah. are fat soluble. Um, we find them in the brain, uh, as Dr. Blake indicated. You know, the other place that we find them, the only other place you excrete uh, fatty liquid is uh, nursing women when they are feeding their baby. So you can find levels of these pesticides in the breast milk of nursing women who are feeding these pesticide laden breast milk to their uh, babies who have developing and relatively unprotected brains. I, um, I saw your reference to uh, heptachlor in your book. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think there's a uh, this is all around us. And I think it's not coincidental that, you know, Parkinson's disease is rising so fa rapidly when we have these pesticides, synthetic pesticides largely developed uh, at following World War II. You so would you say that the omega-3s in fish outweigh the pollutants in fish? I know a lot of the studies are showing both that the omega-3s in fish are helpful cardiovascular, but create more cancer and brain damage. Which one, Dr. Dorsey, would you say is it better or worse? Or I mean, there isn't other it crazy ways? that isn't it crazy we're asking this question that we're making trade-offs based on what uh, are the contaminants to do it? The answer is to get rid of the contaminants so that we don't have to answer these questions. I think, though, meanwhile we may need to stay away from the fish that have these <laughs> contaminants in and will have them for the rest of our lifetimes. Um, regarding the DDT, that's. Um, concentrates in our brains, if we're trying to get rid of chemicals from our body, is a far red infrared sauna seven days a week um, a solution to get chemicals and pesticides out of your body? And if not, is there anything that works to do that, to get the chemicals out of your body? Well, time will get the pesticides out of your body. I would rather prefer that people are exercising to sweat and the sweat gets rid of the, some of the toxins but it is really best not to take them in. If you don't eat animal fat, your concentration of these persistent organic pollutants will go down. And this has been shown in study after study. There's been some great studies on that. So we can get them to go down over time if we stop eating them. But as long as we continue to eat them, they're gonna to continue to circulate in our body, bioaccumulate in our brain, just like they do in the environment. Some of these environmental pollutants like PCBs there's a book called Aquatic Pollution written by a professor at the University of Hawaii. And he's showing bioaccumulation of 100,000 times in some predatory birds compared to what's in the ocean. That's a lot of bioaccumulation. And the, the heptachlor crisis on Maui, which we had where they, they, took, they sprayed heptachlor on the pineapples, cut the tops off and fed them to the cows. And just as Dr. Dorsey said, the women's milk should have been illegal that they were breastfeeding their children because it's so much of these organochlorine brain destroying cancer causing pesticides in them. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Blake. The key is to get, prevent, is to reduce intake of these. Uh, other things you can uh, do is a carbon filter on water can uh, decrease your exposure to pesticides and TCE, uh, washing fruits and vegetables with uh, uh, water and a little bit of soap. Uh, can uh, help reduce your exposure, but we need policy actions uh, to prevent people uh, getting exposed to this because it's, um, you know, there's only so much uh, individuals can do. Uh, yeah, Dr. and also it's um, outside of dicambra, which is the only organochlorine I think that's still in use, the other ones are no longer uh, registered and being sprayed, and they're just everywhere. And so what we can do is if we eat plants, we don't get the bioaccumulation high levels. We get very low levels. But if we're eating animal fat, 
it's guaranteed to have high levels of these pollutants. So there's a lot we can do to lower our risk of these two brain diseases and cancer and many other problems too. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, you mentioned that people with Parkinson had levels of dopamine in the brains 10 times lower of those without the condition. So what can we do to increase the dopamine in our brains? Um, so we know in the 1950s that uh, the brains of individuals with Parkinson's have lower levels of dopamine in it. And that's like, like due to loss of the nerve cells that uh, are uh, producing that dopamine. Uh, the best medical treatment for people who have Parkinson's disease is to give them uh, levodopa, which is uh, Dr. Blake was indicating was an amino acid that's a precursor to the dopamine. So that's by far uh, the best way to do it. There are some other medications, synthetic dopamines, that have their own uh, side effects and are really less effective uh, than levodopa. But the most effective medication is that there are some plants. I, I know there's a lot of focus on nutrition here. P Mucuna purines is a velvet bean plant that has high levels of levodopa. Many parts of the world, many countries in the world don't have ask, access to levodopa. You know, it's a highly effective treatment, very safe, generally safe and uh, very inexpensive to produce, but many parts of the world don't have access uh, to levodopa and their mucuna purines, a velvet bean plant, uh, can be a, a useful therapy uh, for those individuals. I totally agree with mucuna as being uh, effective because it does contain levodopa. However, people in this country, when they ask about taking mucuna purines, uh, they start to realize that you're taking three to five grams of the powder every day. It's a huge amount of powder to choke down and it does seem to have a, a little nicer profile on side effects, but it's hard to find someone who will actually chug down that much powder. Uh, so in more affluent countries, but I do wanna mention there's a, some other treatments that may not have been thought of in medical circles because they're uh, non-patentable, non-profitable. Uh, one of them is sesame seeds, has sesame, which helps to preserve tyrosine hydroxylase so we can make more levodopa ourselves. Another is uh, the genistine in soy products. This also helps to preserve our own production of dopamine. So there are several plants that can actually assist us in making our own dopamine from its precursor levodopa. Okay. Um, back to uh, the question of DHA, EPA. A lot of people are saying that you need to prevent dementia. Uh, DHA EPA, I believe Dr. Furman has recommended taking a supplement of DHA EPA. Um, is this something that you recommend for prevention of uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's? In general, no. And this is because there's two big problems with fish oil supplements, which are the general way that people get DHA and EPA. Two problems with fish oil supplements are one, the pollutants. If you look at PCBs, PDBEs, DDT, all of these brain destroying chemicals, they're highest in fish oil, higher than any other source. So that's a problem. Sometimes manufacturers try to remove some of these, but they don't succeed completely. Uh, now you can get algae based uh, DHA and EPA, and these are lower in the pollutants, much lower in the pollutants, so they're safer from that way, but there's still another problem. Among fatty acids, DHA and EPA, which are long chain, highly unsaturated fatty acids, are very prone to rancidity. And this means that by the time they take the fish or even the algae and cook out the oil and package it and process it and label it and ship it and store it in the shelf, it's rancid. And studies have shown this. One, one study in South, um, South Africa showed 91% rancidity before the stuff was even shipped. So rancidity in these oils can lead to DNA adducts and cancer risk. So we wanna be sure not to take rancid oils. Well, what's the solution? The solution is that we can take these uh, omega-3s from plants, the alpha linolenic acid, and the, this is then, and I've, I've got chapters in my book on this, uh, Fats and Oils Demystified. The alpha linolenic acid is processed with the enzyme delta-60 saturase into steridonic acid. Now that's the rate limiting enzyme for producing EPA and DHA in the body. Remember, 
most Americans produce most of their DHA and EPA in their body compared to what they take in from fish. So we are all making it all the time anyway. It's not an essential nutrient. And then there's uh, elongase and delta-5 desaturase, and you come up with EPA, a couple more steps, and you get DHA. So this can be made in our body. There are several nutrients that are needed that for this to take place. So we can make our own DHA and EPA. This means that we're not getting the pollutants and we're not getting the rancidity. And I see this as a better way to do it. If people are well-nourished and they don't have liver disease, then they probably can make their own EPA and DHA. And this can be tested too. So what specifically should you eat again to get the EPD, DHA and EPA on your own? If this would be, uh, for instance, uh, two heaping tablespoons of ground flax powder is an excellent way to do it. Flax powder has some other advantages. It seems to lower blood pressure and be very protective against prostate cancer. So uh, do get the, only the organic uh, flax seeds, please, because they have been genetically engineered uh, and to be not quite so healthful. Um, regarding uh, drinking water, which is prone to all the pesticides that we discussed before, uh, what should people do to uh, make sure that they don't have anything in their drinking water that's not good? What can they do? So the big, I'll go first, Steve, and then you'll clean up everything I missed. Um, uh, so the big thing are people who get their water in the United States. The big thing is that people get their water from wells. So up to 40 million Americans, one in eight Americans get their water, not from municipal or city water, but from private wells. These private wells uh, tend to be in rural areas and tend to be prone to uh, contamination from pesticides that wash off by nearby farms. Uh, private well water isn't regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act and is often infrequently tested, often only when a person buys or sells their home. So you could be drinking for years or 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 50 years ago, you could have been drinking for years uh, pesticide contaminated uh, well water. So if you get your water from a well, you should uh, test it. In the back of our book, uh, in these gray pages at the back, we provide you resources on how to get your uh, water uh, uh, tested. Um, and then, you know, since writing this book, uh, I, I added a carbon filter to my water. I get my water from city water now. Um, and I do that to decrease my risk of exposure to pesticides and uh, trichloroethylene. Um, I think it's a comment on our times that we have to do so much uh, now just to ensure that we have safe water, clean air and clean food. Yes, the carbon filters are especially valuable because they absorb a lot of these terrible chemicals and you do need to change your carbon filter because their absorption sites will become filled over time. It also might be a good idea to use reverse osmosis to remove most of the pollutants from the water. And of course a sediment filter before either of those. Uh, I do wanna mention when I talked about omega-3s, uh, another great source is clary sage seed oil. Uh, Anna Coulter makes the most wonderful. It seems to not go rancid and it has a magical effect on inflammation in the body, really reducing our inflammatory leukotrienes. So that's a great source outside of flaxseed or uh, chia seeds or hemp seeds. It's uh, probably one of the best. What, um, we've sort of discussed this, but just to be clear, what exactly in terms of prevention of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's what exactly are you saying about fish? Are you saying that we should, shouldn't, neutral? What exactly are you saying about eating fish? fish? And also, what about alcohol? Ha <laughs> ha, good one. Uh, can I talk about fish for a minute? One of the problems with fish is that they contain endotoxins. These endotoxins or lipopolysaccharides are extremely inflammatory. What, what do the doctors give the rats when they want to test a new anti-inflammatory drug? They give them the lipopolysaccharides that are found in fish, beef, poultry, and pork, okay? So these lipopolysaccharides are a real problem with fish because they increase inflammation in the body dramatically. And what does the EPA and DHA do? They decrease inflammation in the body. So it, they're fighting each other. Also, although fish have the, the DHA and EPA, which are omega-3s, they also have arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic acid is found only in animal fat. And arachidonic acid is processed by the COX enzymes, COX-1 and 2. These are cyclooxygenase enzymes, and they are the target of all of the NSAIDs, aspirin, Advil, all of these things. What do they do? They block COX-2. 
from processing arachidonic acid into powerful inflammatory leukotrienes, also thromboxanes for blood clotting. This is really not a good idea to take in more arachidonic acid. Another thing we find with fish is that advanced glycation end products are formed when the fish are cooked. And these advanced glycation end products travel throughout the body, dock onto the rage receptor of the brain and create excess inflammation in the brain. This inflammation leads to oxidation and brain cell death, whether it's in the dopamine producing cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta or in the hippocampus or cortex or wherever. Uh, I, of course, the organochlorine pesticides that are bioaccumulated by fish are very well known, as well as DDT, DDE, and uh, PCBs and other ones. Now, another problem with certain fish is that they're high in cholesterol, especially things like shrimp, very high in cholesterol. And this, when you eat the shrimp, and, and a lot of the oils actually have a lot of cholesterol in them too. So the cholesterol gets oxidized, and oxidized cholesterol leads to oxysterols which can pass the blood-brain barrier. Cholesterol can't, but the oxysterols can, especially 27-hydroxy cholesterol. And when that gets into the brain, it triggers cell death again. So we, we're not sure that fish is really the greatest thing to do. Um, of course, there's excess protein in fish. Humans only need a certain amount of protein, and that excess protein will stop us from both making our own levodopa and from processing the drug levodopa. Uh, there's more about fish, but I think the net result is we should not be eating fish. They're just too polluted for words. Thank you. Do you want to say anything about alcohol, Steve? Well, I do, but I don't know if anyone wants to hear it. I could get unpopular around here. Uh, <laughs> okay, since you asked, uh, studies have shown that a little bit of red wine a day can reduce heart attack risk. And this is, this is true. And Studies have also shown that the same amount of alcohol increases cancer risk greatly and is responsible for vast numbers of cancer deaths throughout the world. So is there a choice? There is a choice. If we eat grapes instead of red wine, then we don't have any higher risk of cancer and we do have lower risk of heart disease, plus those wonderful anthocyanins are going to protect our brains from inflammation and oxidation. So I would recommend the grapes over the grape juice uh, made into wine. Uh, however, I know a lot of people are uh, rather fond of this substance. Okay. Um, Dr. Dorsey, do you want to say anything about uh, alcohol or fish? <laughs> Not great evidence. If you have Parkinson's disease with a mild amount of alcohol, it's probably fine. Uh, if you have Alzheimer's disease, I, I think you probably want to think a little bit harder about um, consuming alcohol. You know, a lot of this depends on what stage of disease you are, you know, how your overall health and the like. Um, you had mentioned um, about advanced glycation end products. Now, when, what about regular cooked food? What happens when you have lentils and quinoa? They're, um, they're cooked foods, but is there, um, maybe I'm getting confused between acrylamides and AGEs, um, but the question is with cooked food, there's been reports that I guess they form something called acrylamides. So whether we're talking about AGEs or acrylamides, when, with healthy whole food plant-based foods, is that still a concern? Well, I'd like to talk about AGEs for just a minute. That means advanced by patient end product. Glycation can occur of proteins both inside the body with high blood sugar levels. In fact, the leading marker for diabetes is glycated hemoglobin, the HbA1c scale, which should be six or less, right, if you don't have diabetes. However, when food is cooked, barbecued, broiled, or fried until it's brown, not blackened or anything, but just brown, the Maillard reaction takes place and we get advanced glycation end products. About half of these are absorbed through the gut into the bloodstream going up to the brain, crossing through the rage receptor and increasing inflammation and free radical damage in the brain by some estimates 50 times the free radical damage that a normal protein would create. However, when you shish kebab vegetables over a barbecue or a broiler, this does not happen. This Maillard reaction cannot happen because of the water. The water blocks the reaction. So advanced glycation end products are never formed with 
fruits or vegetables or nuts or seeds or beans. Uh, you can barbecue tofu all you want. You're never going to get an advanced glycation end product. Now, that's a completely different thing than acrylamides. Acrylamides occur when you brown uh, carbohydrates, such as toast or potato chips. These acrylamides are also damaging components. And uh, we all know potato chips aren't the healthiest food, but it's kind of hard to hear that toast, if it's brown, actually does form acrylamides and not so healthy. So it would be healthier, of course, not to use these damaging cooking methods, but a little toast once in a while sounds like a good idea. Um, okay. Um, there was uh, uh, some information about Alzheimer's saying that um, uh, the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease may harbor bacteria, virus, spirochetes, spiral bacteria, such as those causing Lyme disease, fungi, or parasites. So how do we prevent these? Um, well, I guess they're saying that al some of the people with Alzheimer's were shown to have these bacteria, virus, spirochetes, um, and I guess fungi, parasites. Uh, how do you get this and how do you get them out of you if you already have it? or if you've already had Lyme disease, how do you get these viruses and bacteria and spirochetes out of your body? Dr. Dorsey, how would these get through the blood-brain barrier? Enlighten. Yeah, so this is a little outside my area of expertise. So Lyme disease, uh, spirochete, um, uh, can cause neurological damage, uh, highly effective treatment or antibiotics, the most effective antibiotics likely is medicine called ceftriaxone. Um, and the person who's an expert on fungi is, is Dale, uh, Dr. Uh, Bredesen, who we just lost. Uh, so I would defer to him uh, on that topic. Okay. Well, thank you. And I think it's my opinion that most of these are prevented from entering the brain if the blood-brain barrier is intact. Now, I know there can be damage to the blood-brain barrier, both in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease that allow foreign particles to enter the brain but in large part, I do not see, and I have not seen the research showing that a significant amount of these, and that there is a significant problem for these two neurologic disorders. Okay. Um, is cardiovascular disease, if you have cardiovascular disease, did that, does that put you at greater risk for Alzheimer's? Oh, absolutely. Uh, studies have shown that people with uh, atherosclerosis have a much higher risk, two to three times the risk for Alzheimer's disease. And that, of course, is because of vascular dementia. Those with plaque in their arteries are going to have a little bit of the plaque break loose and plug a capillary or an arteriole in the brain. And when this happens consistently, you get vascular dementia, which eliminates parts of your memory and your, your cognitive cells are damaged by that. Of course, if a larger piece of plaque breaks away, you can have a real stroke or a heart attack. Also, the same saturated fat that creates this atherosclerotic plaque and high cholesterol increases the amyloid beta production, both through lipid raft changes and through the uh, secretase enzymes, which create the amyloid beta in the brain. So there are many ways that the diet that create atherosclerotic plaque also increase Alzheimer's disease. And it would be nice if people did not eat more than 12 grams of saturated fats a day, which greatly lower their risk of Alzheimer's disease, as I described it at some length in my talk today. Um, I have a statistic here from one of the books that said research found that those with strong social bonds were 50% less likely to die than those with weaker social network. Social connectivity is an important as, is as important as other accepted risk factors such as diet, exercise, and sleep for healthy aging. Additionally, those who are married exchange support with family members, have contact with friends, participate in community groups, and engaged in paid work are 46% less likely to develop dementia. dementia um, does this resonate with your research? Steve, this is you. Dr. Dorsey, are you going to talk about this? No, I was going to leave. I said, it's you. <laughs> well, I've certainly seen a ton of research on social activity improving people's memory and slowing the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And I think this is a matter of using the brain too. Uh, also brain games, 
uh, our neuropsychologist, a real expert, Dr. Thomas Harding, and he not only analyzes the brain, we call him a human MRI because he can actually determine what parts of the brain are damaged with his neuropsychological testing. But he also, when he finds a weak area, he can design a brain game to strengthen that area. And so he assigns these different ways for people to re-strengthen their brain. But social activity is, you know, have you ever noticed it's really exhausting? There, there's a lot of connections being made when you're out in a crowd meeting people and getting to know people. And this is like a brain game. It exercises the brain, makes new neural connections. It helps with plasticity. It helps with the brain-derived neurotrophic factor and, and getting your brain neural stem cells to become real cells to replace dead ones. So it, yes, it has a tremendously good effect. The socialization is widely studied and widely shown to be beneficial. I haven't seen so much in Parkinson's disease though, have you? No, but I think the, the mechanism by which, you know, socialization, education, exercise might all work is uh, either creating or preserving uh, synapses or the connectivities, connections of within the brain. So I think all those three are quite beneficial for a wide range of brain diseases. How about general anesthesia, anesthesia? Does that contribute to cognitive decline? And also, what about um, if the answer to that is yes, does that mean anything about local anesthesia that I get at the dentist? Well, general anesthesia, of course, uh, can create cognitive problems and memory decline. It depends on how long the operation is, how long you're under the really long operations. It's very common to have cognitive problems. Now, sometimes they clear up over time and sometimes they don't. But anesthesia is definitely a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and mixed dementia itself. Of course, people who need operations may not be in such great health themselves. So that may skew the results a little bit. Yeah, I, I think uh, exactly as Dr. Blake was suggesting, in addition to the effects of anesthetics, which obviously impair memory as part of their intended uh, use, is so you don't remember things, um, is that you know, the people getting these, especially for cardiovascular heart disease, uh, have significant um, problems, medical problems, and it's quite clear that people after they get bypass surgeries and stuff like that have significant cognitive worsening, all the more reason to eat a healthy diet, uh, exercise, prevent yourself from ever getting these diseases in the first place is treatments and cures aren't easy and uh, have their own uh, adverse effects. Um, doc Couldn't agree more. Uh, Dr. Dorsey, based on your research, would you avoid playing golf on golf courses because <laughs> of all the tremendous amount of research you did on the dangers of all these different chemicals? Um, so I don't play golf, so it's easy for me to say. But I would be really, so there was a one study that uh, found uh, that uh, 18 people, I think, uh, developed uh, Parkinson's disease who all lived around a golf course and 15 of the 18 or 16 of the 18 lived downwind uh, of the golf course. Uh, Robin Williams, I think, grew up uh, right near a golf course and developed a Parkinsonian uh, disorder. Um, I think this, these are real concerns. Um, I mentioned uh, there have been some studies linking uh, pesticide use on uh, football or soccer fields pitches. Um, to uh, Parkinson's disease and to ALS um, is we, we should be making sure that the safe, the sports that we play to improve our health are indeed safe, whether by the nature of the sport or by the nature of the chemicals that we're putting on the fields um, to play those sports. Thank I think you. all of us would be fine to have a little few more weeds and a few less causes of Parkinson's and ALS. Is, is your conclusion that the specific chemicals that you wrote about, the TCE, the paraquat, the other one, are really the problem, or are you saying those are the problem, but all pesticides are probably um, of a concern, or you really feel it was really just those specific ones? Uh, so Rachel Carson, in her book, Silent Spring, wrote in 1962, uh, the book that launched the environmental movement uh, leading to the formation of the EPA in 1970. She was really uh, attacking not pesticides per se, but indiscriminate use of pesticides. So DDT, for example, saved million, thousands, if not millions of people from dying of malaria in World War II, but after World War II, got a hero's welcome and we had indiscriminate use of it, literally puffing uh, DDT uh, on streets and having kids play right behind the DDT that was being sprayed. So, so people can make arguments uh, for pesticides. What we argue in the book is that there's certain of these pesticides are closely linked to Parkinson's and indeed many of them likely cause uh, Parkinson's disease. And those 
we can do without. And if we need to use pesticides, which can be debated, if we need to use the pesticides, we should just make sure that they're safe, just like we uh, work, the FDA requires that medicines be safe. We should have the same requirements of that uh, for um, pesticides. Um, yes, and of course, there are many other studies that have looked at uh, farming areas and the pesticides sprayed on farms and finding a lot more Parkinson's disease in areas downwind from where they're spraying on farm areas. It's, it's not just golf courses and playing fields. It's wherever certain pesticides are sprayed. And uh, dicambra is a real concern because it's the last organochlorine that's being used and it's very, very dangerous. And it would be great if it could get banned. In addition to consuming them as, as Steve was implying is I think we gotta be really concerned about what we're inhaling uh, because by inhaling things, we get around the normal protective barriers of the blood brain barrier. Uh, and we're allowing things to basically gain a portal uh, to the brain that really should be uh, closed off. And really one that we haven't been selected for as humans uh, to, to do because for the vast majority of human existence, we haven't had inhaled uh, toxins causing loss of disease. Like inhaled for sure. And there have been studies also of, of pesticide applicators where their families get, get Parkinson's disease from handling their clothing. Uh, it's just, the stuff is really toxic and uh, some, somehow our government should protect us from these things. And we need to hold them accountable to do so. Okay. Yeah, financially, if possible, that would do it. Um, back in 1976, there were only 5 million people with diabetes. Today, between diabetes and prediabetes, there are 100 million people. And this dramatic increase reveals why so many people are more at high risk for Alzheimer's today. So um, is this the case? Is this that is when we're dealing with Alzheimer's, should we be thinking of this as a sugar thing like diabetes, that um, the same way you would, you would deal with diabetes, the same steps you would take to prevent diabetes, you'd be working on preventing Alzheimer's? I mean, do you, is it in your opinion, when people say Alzheimer's is type three diabetes, does that something you think, or how do you think about it in terms of uh, its relation to diabetes? Can I start, Steve? Okay, if I start. Sure, yeah, sure. So I, I don't think it's necessarily around sugar. I, I think it's around prevention. So uh, you go from 5 million to 100 and, what'd you say, 100 and, 10 million? 100 million with diabetes or prediabetes. Yeah. So you go 20 million increase in a disease in the span of 50 years. Well, what's doing that? And there has to be changes to our environment. And if you know, look at, you know, soda and fast food, industrial food production, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that we have soda machines in the schools with kids. I mean, what are we doing as a society uh, and creating uh, obese children? I mean, it is unbelievable what we are uh, putting up with and tolerating. It, it, we should just be changing the course completely. And I think the same thing for Alzheimer's disease, you know, Alzheimer's, I think air pollution would be a huge factor. Air pollution costs every person in the world three years of life. Three years of our life expectancy is lost to air pollution worldwide. And I think it's fueling the rise of uh, Alzheimer's disease and likely contributing to the rise of uh, Parkinson's disease. We mentioned cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, increasing your risk for uh, uh, al Alzheimer's disease. Many of these diseases are to a large extent preventable. I think Parkinson's disease is to a large extent preventable. Uh, obesity is certainly to a large extent preventable. Type 2 diabetes is certainly to a large extent preventable. Alzheimer's disease, to some extent, is likely preventable. ALS, is to a large extent, may be preventable. Many cancers are preventable. Until we wake up and change our environment, hold our representatives accountable, we're going to be continue to suffer the adverse health consequences. We'll pay 100 times more on the back end for treatments and cures that are toxic and disfiguring then we'll pay on the front end. If we change the course of it, like we did for HIV, like we do, we live in a world free of polio. We don't have great polio treatments or great polio treatment centers because we just quite frankly have a world that's largely free of polio. If we do the same thing for these other diseases, we can live in a much healthier world and one we can have lar long, longer, healthier lives for us to enjoy. Well said, Dr. Dorsey, I, I agree. Um, now about diabetes, type two diabetes, uh, I wrote a book called Diabetes Breakthrough, the key to insulin resistance. And this is actually my latest book. And I'm giving a talk uh, at this conference on April 10th, at, where I will be talking about diabetes and what is the problem. And the real problem with diabetes is not just sugars, it's sugars and saturated fat together. And this is the problem. The problem is insulin resistance. 
where the cell membranes of our muscle cells and our liver cells become insulin resistant. And they're insulin resistant because of the excesses of saturated fatty acids in the diet, as Dr. Dorsey mentioned, junk food, fast food, all of this stuff that is not really food at all. And a lot of it is loaded with saturated fat. Why? Because it's satisfying to the stomach. That's why people love saturated fat. If you get your saturated fat down, then what happens is, okay, when you have too much saturated fat in your body, then it changes the fluidity of the cell membrane so that fewer insulin receptors are found there down to half as many. But there's more because as you get more saturated fats, the insulin tries to get the excess blood sugar into the cell so it can't damage your arteries and your eyes and your kidneys. But it doesn't succeed because the transmembrane protein, the insulin receptor, has an alpha end that the insulin docks to and a beta end on the inside of the cell where the insulin receptor substrate has to dock into. But with excess saturated fats, you get excess cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha, which create, it's a long story, but I'll tell you a little more of it, which creates suppressor of cytokine three. And this inactivates the insulin receptor substrate so that it cannot make GLUT4, the glucose transporter, and it can't get the blood sugar into the cell. So this is the problem. Now, what happens when people lower their saturated fats for a couple of weeks? Their type two diabetes goes away, even if they're still eating rapidly absorbable carbohydrates and sugar, because our bodies work really well. If we don't have insulin resistance, we could drink, heaven forbid, uh, 12 ounces, 12 teaspoons of sugar in a Coca-Cola, and all of that sugar would trigger a bunch of insulin, which would trigger a bunch of insulin receptors, which if they work well, would get that sugar into our cells. Okay, obesity may still be a result. And one of the problems with excess sugar is that once our glycogen stores are filled up and the cells have all they need, the excess sugar is made into palmitic acid, which is the worst saturated fat to create insulin resistance. So excess sugar also creates insulin resistance. So my advocacy would be for keeping saturated fats below 12 grams per day and keeping sugars to slow releasing carbohydrates, such as are found in whole intact grains, beans, some root crops, uh, and you know, like purple sweet potatoes, uh, and whole grains like um, maybe amaranth, quinoa, some of these. So that, that really is the story on insulin resistance and type two diabetes. Study after study, which I quote in my book or my lecture, have shown that you can reverse type two diabetes with this type of a diet. And unfortunately, it's not profitable. It's not a drug. It's not patentable. It just works. Okay, if you would like to ask Dr. Dor Dorsey and Steve Blake uh, questions, please raise your hands. You can click the reactions button and then do raise your hand and I will call on you and you can speak to them directly. Uh, the remaining time is devoted to you. So you could ask whatever question you would like. Um, I do want to address one question that uh, people <clears throat> asked me um, and I just want to read you directly word for word from YouTube, uh, their current uh, policy. Um, the current policy says, YouTube doesn't allow content that poses a serious risk of egregious harm by spreading, and spreading medical misinformation about currently administered vaccines that are approved and confirmed to be safe and effective by local health authorities and by the World Organization, WHO, which means that any content that we make that we post on YouTube is not allowed to conflict with their policy, um, which means it um, is, if, it, if anyone says something that's in disagreement what, with what the World Health Organization says, then that would be against their policy and our YouTube our channel could get in trouble or taken down. So for that reason, you do not hear us ask any questions um, or discussing uh, vaccine safety. So we apologize for all of you that were interested in having that discussion. That, will have to ha that would have to happen somewhere else um, in terms of for this 17 day conference, uh, YouTube has a clear policy about uh, that topic and uh, you can look it up on YouTube under vaccine misinformation policy that we are um, guided by. So I uh, hope that clarifies uh, why that is not a topic at our conference. Okay. Uh, 
Shashi, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Um, I'm from where Dr. Dorsey is, Rochester, New York. And uh, I have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is uh, like uh, air filters to purify the uh, home air. If you have in your uh, uh, heating, cooling unit, HEPA filter, is that not enough and you should get separate uh, air filters for each room and what kind of air filter is effective in removing uh, most of the toxins? So that one is about the air filter. And the second question is, uh, we have heard so much about exercise, but if the person has no energy and no motivation um, and are taking the usual supplements, you know, the B12 and uh, uh, D and uh, some uh, uh, omega-3s, then what is um, there to help develop motivation, energy, overcome fatigue and infuse the drive in the person who needs to overcome the disease? Um, I'll start. So, Mr. Arnold, thanks for, very much for, for the question. Um, so, uh, I don't, can't answer the question about air filters. I really uh, haven't looked into that in depth. I think the key thing with uh, air filters is like, you know, um, is we need to be mindful that of the environment in which we live. Uh, you know, you might have a clean air in your kitchen or your bedroom or in your house, but that may not be reflective of what's uh, outside. Now, there's some suggestion if you're driving in traffic, you know, you can do the uh, indoor, the continuous air circulation so that uh, you keep your windows up and you have the air in your car uh, circulate itself. And air filters may be beneficial, but again, it's not an area that I've investigated deeply. Uh, what to do if you don't have the motivation for exercise? Um, maybe uh, Steve's going to have suggestions here. You know, we need to create we need to create a sport for everyone and everyone for a sport. And not everyone's got the same drive and motivation, nor does everyone have the same uh, health and freedom of disability uh, that uh, uh, that many of us enjoy. And so we need to create uh, opportunities for people to stay physically active, uh, regardless of their uh, individual circumstances. And some people might need a little bit more support. Uh, I'll just say what I do for myself. Every time I exercise, I think about my future self. And I don't, I take care of a lot of older people and I've never met an older individual who's ever regretted doing exercise when they were younger. Um, so that's when I think about exercising. I don't do it for myself today. I do it for my, you know, hopefully I like to be 70 or 80 years old and I do it for that person. And tall people don't age well. You can't see it right now, but I'm six foot five. And I just never realized that tall people don't age well. So I, I look at things that for uh, looking, projecting forward uh, into the future for me, maybe that'll be helpful to you, but some people need other means of support. Okay, yeah, uh, a HEPA filter might be a good idea these days, uh, both to filter out germs and bugs and other things, but it depends if you're having smoke in your air, which can be very toxic, have a lot of pollutants in it, then you may need a humidifier uh, combination with the filter in order to keep your air cleaner inside. Now, as far as exercise goes, I know that I, I love to run. That's, that's my favorite sport. But every time when I get off my uh, chair and get out there and start running, I feel great. And by the time I come back an hour later, I feel fantastic. So what you need to do with exercise is you need to do it on faith. Just get out there and do it. And you need to do what you love to do. We all have sports that we love and hate. Some people would never run, but they love to swim. Other people love to play ball. Other people like team sports. Whatever you like to do, that's what you should do because you'll do it and build it up little by little. One of my greatest teachers says, activity creates energy and inactivity breeds fatigue. I think of him almost every time I go running because I know if I'm not active, I will be fatigued. And if I do get a nice workout in, I'll feel energetic. And he, another teacher says the legs pump the brain. Well, that's not anatomically correct, but it's true anyway. <laughs> Thank you. M.A., would you like to ask a question and where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles. And yes, um, I would like to ask um, about eggs. I, I realize this is a uh, whole food plant-based and... and uh, <clears throat> 
I, I'm having trouble giving up. I've given up processed meat and red meat, but I like eggs for breakfast. Um, are there any that are healthy or can I take out one yolk or, or just no eggs? What, what's the deal? Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. No eggs, that's the deal. Uh, first of all, eggs have nothing in them that you want. Uh, yes, they have protein, but we all get too much protein. We don't get too little. I analyze diets constantly for decades. And I, the three people I found with low protein were getting half the calories they needed to survive. So a protein we don't need. Lutein is advertised as being in eggs, but there's less than a dozen eggs. There isn't a leaf or two of kale. It's a very poor source of lutein. And some people talk about phosphatidylcholine being important for the brain, but that choline in eggs turns into TMAO, trimethylamine and oxide, which is tremendously bad for our circulatory system and our atherosclerotic plaque, and of course, for vascular dementia. So in large part, the white part of the egg won't hurt you. I see no reason at all to eat it, but it won't hurt you. But the yolk part is very dangerous. They also bioaccumulate and uh, environmental toxins. And of course, the yolk of the egg is tremendously high in cholesterol, which can turn to oxysterols and damage, again, atherosclerotic plaque and enter into our brain and damage our brain. So I would say no eggs would be just the perfect amount. In fact, a recent report looked at eggs causing cancer and cigarettes causing cancer. They looked at egg, eggs per day and, and cigarette packs per week, and the graphs were almost identical. Wow. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Dean, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Uh, yeah. I, I want to thank you very much. Give me time to ask the question. I'm from the uh, Maryland in uh, Baltimore. Um, I, my question is, uh, um, in, China, in China, they have said um, before they don't have a lot of medication, they use the massage. Every day, just calm the hair, um, calm the, um, the, do you think the massage, um, like the 300, 300 times from the brain, just the, like the calm the hair, then can um, recover the, the Alzheimer? There have been a few studies, thanks for the question. There have been a few studies in massage and Parkinson's disease. I don't know about in Alzheimer's disease, largely not been shown to be terribly helpful. Um, I, I, I know I have patients who do it I'm, and it makes them feel better. But as far as changing the underlying path, pathology of the diseases, I think it's unlikely to do so. But in terms of improving relaxation or mood or uh, reducing stiffness, it, it could be helpful. Thank you. My, my, um, because I read a lot of Chinese, um, they, give, they give the report. Um, for example, some people almost um, forget many things. Then they just the massage, then they try to concentrate. Then eventually they can remember. They can remember long, very long article. Exactly. They recovered. I don't know. This, uh, is I need the research to do. It's, it's like the every day calm, calm the hair 300 times and concentrate. Yeah, I, I, I hear the thing about uh, combing the hair and uh, might help with concentration, but I, I just haven't seen it. Uh, of course, I'm not privy to everything that's written in Chinese or all the Chinese literature. If you have additional questions, you can email me at info at endingpd.org. If you have a study or something, I'm happy to review it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Stephanie, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Stephanie? Stephanie, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm from um, DC. And I have a question. I have a disease called PCOS that causes insulin resistance. And I heard you guys speaking earlier about insulin resistance and fats. 
What about healthy fats like avocados, nuts, um, some of the healthier oils like avocado oil, olive oil, et cetera, are those off limits? Oh, well, I'd love to answer that, Stephanie. Uh, I think that a reasonable amount of avocados is fine. Avocados have both vitamin E and vitamin C, not to mention carotenoids are very helpful from an antioxidant standpoint. And they have very low saturated fat. So they do have a little bit. Uh, if you, you, know, you eat too many of them, you can start getting in trouble. If, if you don't want to gain weight, you shouldn't eat too many avocados. We live on an avocado orchard, so we know about eating too many avocados. But when we get too many avocados, we make them into avocado fudge ice cream, which is just avocados and sugar and chocolate. Wow, and vanilla, that's great. So healthy fats, yes to avocados, yes to nuts and seeds, yes to nut butters. Uh, and yet to olives. As far as extracted oils go, try and eat the very minimum or no extracted oils because they've lost a lot of the goodness that's in the plant that they're made from. So minimize, if you do need to use some oil for cooking, a little sesame oil or olive, extra virgin olive oil would be the choice. And I keep that down to a very small amount, please. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? Yes. Um, uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm from Southern California. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to you gentlemen. You're just saving so many lives. Um, I'm gonna be 82 years old and I've been taking sleeping pills for 30 years. My sleep specialist said that um, it can temporarily affect my memory. Oh, and it doesn't very much, but the point is I'm trying to get off of them. And the nights that I don't sleep, I don't take them, I don't sleep. So which is worse, not sleeping all night or taking the pills? I, I do melatonin, I exercise periodically. I, I'm on a plant-based diet. I don't eat any sugar. I do everything you guys say to do, but I'm addicted to those sleeping pills. It's the only pill I take. What's your answer? Um, so Ms. Friedman, thanks very much for, uh, for your question. Um, uh, it depends on the sleeping pill. Certain sleeping pills, especially benzodiazepines can affect uh, thinking and can become a uh, foster dependence and can be very difficult to come off of them. Uh, in general, as you probably know, you probably want to have good sleep hygiene, trying to go to bed at the same time every day, waking up at the same time every day, avoiding eating uh, before going to bed, um, uh, avoiding screens, uh, <laughs> except maybe for this conference uh, and others uh, before, you go, uh, before you go to bed. Um, if you're on benzodiazepines and the like, sometimes you can start by reducing uh, the amount of your taking at each uh, dose, for example. And sometimes that can help people get weaned uh, off these medicines. Uh, but again, to my earlier comment, sometimes treatments can be more damaging um, than the disease. Um, I tried a year ago and I ended up in really bad shape because I wasn't sleeping. So uh, I, I know, except for this conference, well, when should I, should I stop using my phone at noon? <laughs> or, I mean, I'm serious because uh, yeah. this is a problem. I do, I do use it the screen. I, um, I can't sleep, so I turn on the TV to fall asleep, and I don't want to do that. But I, I, I don't know what to do. Should I just wing it and not sleep for a while and get so tired that I have to sleep? I don't know. I, I'd have to be your doctor to give you better advice, but. I'll tell you they what don't I have do. any I, I, answers. I'm sorry. I, I put my phone when I when I go to bed. I put my phone in my closet and I leave it there. Uh, so the only thing I see at night is the the, the newspaper and then my wife and then uh, sleep. Um, so I, I think uh, these screens can be very disrupting to uh, our sleep wake uh, cycles. Uh, exercise uh, can be beneficial for helping promoting sleep. Avoiding food at night, um, going to bed, getting a new habit uh, can all be helpful, but it can take time. I right, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Hey, Lorraine, I would like to say that for me, exercise is number one for going to sleep. If I don't exercise in a day, I'm in the office all day long and I really don't get any exercise, I don't sleep well either. 
But if I do get at least one good session of aerobic exercise, it really helps me sleep. So do stay within your aerobic limits. Uh, but if you can do that, it can really help you sleep. And for me, that's my best way to go to sleep. Thank you. Thank, good luck. thank you so much. Manuel, would you like to ask a question or where are you from? I'm from Ottawa, Canada. My question is, is there a link between aluminum and Alzheimer? Because I would like to change my pots, my casseroles to cast iron. I don't know if you heard about that. Steve, you wanna go about aluminum and uh, Alzheimer's? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, well, it really depends which studies you look at. All the studies published by Reynolds uh, and sponsored by them show that aluminum is not a problem at all. And um, that's just, you know, pretty standard. Uh, aluminum actually does not cross the blood brain barrier. That's good news. However, it can be inhaled. And so antiperspirants often contain aluminum and that way it can bypass the blood brain barrier and get into your sinuses and into your brain. So that's one of the main routes there. On the other hand, I see no reason to use aluminum pots or pans or even aluminum foil uh, because aluminum is not a essential mineral for humans. So we won't lose anything by not getting it. And I would say the research is not conclusive. Unless you get the aluminum into your brain, it probably won't hurt it. But there are several routes where you can get it in, uh, usually inhaled. So watch out for those things. And of course, aluminum is found in uh, baking powders, certain baking powders, and of course, many pans. And it might be a good idea to eliminate it if you're worried about it. But I don't see it as a huge problem. But like I say, the research has been skewed both ways. So it's hard to make a conclusion. Just one other point, building off uh, Steve's comments about air pollution, uh, hitchhiking on those tiny little particles that make up smog are some heavy metals like uh, lead, platinum, and iron that can then uh, bypass our normal protective uh, mechanisms in our nose and our uh, upper airways yes. and uh, likely uh, carry those uh, heavy metals uh, into the brain. But I don't think the pots that you're using would be the, my biggest concern. Yeah. Isabel, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Yes, please. Um, hi, I'm from New Zealand. Um, I'm asking because my mom has uh, dementia. She's now 82 and she has dementia since uh, she was 64 when it started. Um, but she always suffered from cholesterol and she always took statin. And I wonder if statin uh, um, triggered the, the dementia because the statin has a bad name. Um, Stephen, I'll go first. Uh, so, uh, Isabel, first of all, thanks for your question. I'm sorry to hear about your mother's health. Um, so, uh, high cholesterol and other heart disease risk factors increase the risk for dementia. Um, statins largely work by decreasing the cholesterol uh, uh, cholesterol levels and may help uh, decrease, uh, lower the risk uh, for heart, certainly for heart disease and may do so for uh, dementia. I think it's unlikely that the statins themselves are contributing to the dementia that your mom's experiencing. Well, yes, they do decrease cholesterol and cholesterol is a risk factor for dementia. However, uh, statins, uh, which what they do is they, reduce the amount of coenzyme Q10 that we make in our cells by about 40%, a significant amount, so that the lack of coenzyme Q10 can cause brain cells to die and mitochondria to underproduce energy so brain cells die. So there is a problem. Studies looking at statins and dementia have come up about even because the good news is they lower the cholesterol and lower the risk, and the bad news is they lower the coenzyme Q10 and raise the risk. There are other ways to lower blood cholesterol. One lady we worked with had a total cholesterol of 384, and she lowered that down to 144 with no drugs by dietary changes over the course of one year. So if you can change your cholesterol with diet, as your cholesterol comes down, ask your doctor, please, my cholesterol is so low, can I cut my statins in half? And he, maybe he'll say yes, and then eventually get 
off of the statins. So you have only the good benefits of having low cholesterol and not the side effects of the drug. There are other possible side effects of statins, which are muscle problems that happen in certain individuals too. All treatments have their side effects. So the more you can do without medicines, the better. Uh, Steve, Dr. Dorsey, would you like to make any final comments? We're very grateful for all the time you've given us tonight. Any final thoughts to wrap up with? I want to say that I am honored to work with Dr. Dorsey and Dr. Bredesen. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, I'd love to stay in touch over time. And thank you all for attending tonight and listening in on this conference. And thank you also for moderating this talk. Uh, we really appreciate the great job you did. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen Shore. Thanks very much, Steve Blake. I was delighted to be a part of this great conference and this great panel. I think we've learned a lot uh, over the last couple of hours is that uh, many diseases that we've all discussed about uh, over the last couple of hours are to a large extent preventable. And it's really incumbent upon us as individuals and as members of, com our, of our com given communities uh, to change the course uh, of these diseases. We've inherited a world that's largely free of polio. We've inherited a world that's where HIV is treatable and preventable. We inherited a world where uh, drinking and driving is socially unacceptable. How about we reciprocate and give future generations a world that's largely free of Alzheimer's disease and largely free of uh, Parkinson's. I can think of a few better gifts. Um, Dr. Dorsey and uh... Uh, Steve, how, Steve how, how would someone get in touch with you if someone wants to follow up with you? What's the best way to get in touch with either of you? Both well, for of me, my website is drsteveblake.com, www.drsteveblake.com. Uh, my books are generally under $10 in an ebook format, and you can get uh, brain and body food if you're having uh, memory problems there too. Um, uh, you can reach me at info at endingpd.org. I put the email in there, books available on Amazon. If you can't afford a copy of the book and would uh, like it, uh, just uh, let us know and we'll send you one. Uh, info at endingpd.org, books available on Amazon. This is Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month, April, first day of Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. All the authors are donating all of our proceeds to efforts to stop and end uh, Parkinson's disease. So if you can afford the book, what better gift uh, for Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month? Thanks. Okay, can, can we unmute the whole audience so we could all thank uh, Dr. Dorsey and Steve Blake? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've all been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bummer about it. Thank you. 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 Great information. Thank you. Very much. This was so informative. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Go, Steve.